Want to choose the next series Brad binge watches? Subscribe to our Patreon and vote in our poll by clicking the links in the comments and description or by visiting patreon.com slash the cinema snob. Saved by the Bell. It doesn't matter if you loved this show or you hated it, you've seen more than one episode of Saved by the Bell. It's the Saturday morning cultural phenomenon that, honestly, I didn't watch on Saturday mornings because, luckily, it re-aired pretty much any time of day. When I watched Saved by the Bell in the early 90s, it was weekday mornings for about an hour when I was getting ready for school, alternating between Garfield and Friends and The Bozo Show. Then I'd watch it for about an hour after school, alternating between Family Matters and The Simpsons. I can't wait to dive deep into this show featuring the wild and insane students of Bayside High in California, but first... So Good Morning Miss Bliss was a Disney Channel series starring Haley Mills as Miss Bliss, a teacher at JFK Junior High in Indianapolis. That is, after an episode zero pilot featuring Brian Austin Green was burned off in the summer. Even this show's history has a weird continuity. NBC executive Brandon Tartikoff wanted a series inspired by his own beloved sixth grade teacher, so he asked Peter Engel to develop a show created by Sam Bobrick. That show was Good Morning Miss Bliss, which also featured Mr. Belding, Zach Morris, Screech, and Lisa. Plus, there was Sorta Jesse with Nikki and Sorta Slater with Mikey. I didn't see this show on the Disney Channel, but I saw it in syndication when it was retitled as Saved by the Bell and even given the Saved by the Bell style opening. I know I should have been confused by suddenly it's starring Haley Mills and suddenly they're in a different location, but I really didn't think anything of it because, again, the show was never that great at continuity anyway. Now that I'm watching it as an adult, I'm thinking, holy shit, Zack Summer Love is a teenage Carla Gugino. This confirms that Saved by the Bell is in the Karen Sisko universe. No, seriously, her character's name here is also Karen. And TK Carter plays a teacher here, which he also did on Punky Brewster, another shared universe. Can't wait until he teaches Zack all about the Challenger explosion. All right, so Zack Summer Love has come to JFK High only Zack lied and told her that he was a ninth grader. Will she figure out this secret? The pilot is like watching a sitcom Grease if the teacher narrated it. It's not quite as over the top as Saved by the Bell, but you can see the seeds being planted, like when Zack shows up at his teacher's backyard and interrupts her date because he needs advice on his girl problems. Miss Bliss has to keep this a secret from her date, too. <laughs> what kind of relationship did Tarnikoff have with his teacher. Plus, Karen must have changed schools when she dumped Zack because she's never seen again. <laughs> this is weird. I love that Miss Bliss narrates this as if she's narrating a really inappropriate erotic novel talking about Screech staring at Lisa in class and shit. Plus, it's the second episode that now deals with Miss Bliss's single life. This time, she thinks that the substitute teacher has the hots for her. The substitute turns out to be married, but she gets a love letter from secret admirer Zack. Whoa, hold on, this is a misunderstanding. Zack ghost wrote this for Screech to give to Lisa, and now Miss Bliss is trying to figure out who wrote it. At one point, she thinks Mr. Belding wrote it in order to cheat on his wife, and then she thinks he's trying to seduce her in the lunchroom, but then he thinks that she wrote the letter. It's crazy, and TK Carter's Milo Williams factors into none of this, but he's still wildly interested. Hormones are high here, and not just from the students. This is more of a prequel to Sex in the City than the Carrie Diaries. Hell, Miss Bliss's first name is Carrie. I am good at coming up with fake connections between shows. The kids all learn about stocks because Miss Bliss gets them to pay attention to the stock market. And I remember our economics teacher in high school, Mr. Filter, teaching us about stocks in the same way. Only this is Zach Morris world and he needs quick cash because he broke his dad's $300 camera. There's only one way to do that. Get the other kids to invest in potatoes. 
But oops, Zack buys on margin and owes the difference when the potatoes tank, only it was Miss Bliss's money and project, so she's the one who owes this. It actually costs her her car. Wow, only three episodes in and Zack is already the Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> yes, Zack Morris is a monster, but I love this guy. In the previous episode, he got caught getting Screech to write his report for him, and Miss Bliss told him, a smile and an apology is not going to get you out of things, Zack. Um, Zack Morris is the main example of, yes, both of those things will get him out of trouble. Oh, I think he had to sell his dirt bike and VCR in order to pay his dad and Miss Bliss back, but he only kind of mentions that he might do that. It doesn't show him actually do it, which means he probably didn't. You know, I do kind of remember one weird thing about this in syndication. A high school Zack would intro these episodes by saying, here's my junior high adventures, but then Miss Bliss would be the one narrating them. Who's telling this story? This one's the science class episode where Mr. Morton wants to dissect frogs, only Nikki is against this, so she takes the frogs and sets them free. I feel like every sitcom that takes place in a school has this plot. Only here I kind of understand her objections. When I was in school, yeah, we dissected frogs, but they were already dead and frozen. Serial killer Mr. Morton comes in with a box of live frogs that has live animals written on it. No shit they want to save the frogs. Every teacher here is bad in some way, shape, or form. In Miss Bliss's class, they're all taking a test, but she has to leave. She tells the kids to abide by the honor system and then puts Zack in charge. Why? And why is she giving Mr. Belding shit for only giving Nikki a warning? I'm sorry, didn't you have to sell your car last week because of Zack? It's parent-teacher week. Will there be some banging? Oh, absolutely. Why is the Disney Channel version of this show raunchier than the NBC version? Miss Bliss had a hot weekend with a man named Peter, and they kept things super discreet with no names. Guess the twist. Peter is Zack's dad. <laughs> Zack's dad banged Miss Bliss, bro. The hell are the odds of this accidental hookup happening? I'd say the odds are pretty good. You see, in regular Saved by the Bell, Zack's dad's name is Derek, and he and his mom are still together, whereas here, dad's name is Peter, and the parents are divorced. Now, that could just be a case of retconning, but oh no, I don't think it's that simple. I think Zack hired a fake dad with embezzled potato money. If fake dad Peter charms Miss Bliss, she'll go easy on Zack because he now has leverage on her. You could argue that Peter's Robert Pine is playing himself here, and he needed Zack Zack's acting gig after Chips ended. You can tell the Saved by the Bell credits were not intended for Good Morning Miss Bliss because every time it cuts to them after the intro, it feels so awkward and like the scene didn't even finish. Anyway, bully episodes aren't specific to just school sitcoms. Every sitcom has a bully episode, and here is Saved by the Bell's first. Andrus Jones plays new kid Deke. He wears a leather jacket and breaks pencils. He was also in Elm Street 4. Makes sense after Freddy got a mention in the previous episode, and if you missed that mention, Freddy is mentioned in this one too. Miss Bliss discovers that he's illiterate, which explains why he's in junior high and clearly 21 years old. At least Milo and Miss Bliss's best friend, Miss Palladrino, sort of have a brief subplot this time that doesn't involve them just simply showing up and saying, Oh, Miss Bliss, those students done gone crazy. I guess Deke got transferred to yet another school because he is never seen in another episode again, but at least he found out he's illiterate. And he left right before Mr. Belding brought back the eighth grade dance. You see, total babe Shanna asks Zach to the dance. Only Mikey is the one who wanted to ask her to the dance. He even helped her with her homework. This causes anger and jealousy between Zach and Mikey. I feel like I'm watching 
watching a round of auditions for Zach Kelly and Slater, and not the actual show. Plus, this is one time when Zach really didn't do anything wrong. He didn't know Mikey's feelings when he said yes to Shanna. Plus, Mikey's kind of creepy. He tells Zach, you take Shanna to the dance and you're a dead man. He even almost punches Zach at the dance while the teachers are standing there like, huh, let's not get involved. In this case, I'm rooting for Mikey to have a teary-eyed Last American Virgin style ending. Look, this dance shouldn't be happening anyway. Shanna tells Zach she's gonna be wearing a tight leather miniskirt and that they're gonna have alone time together. <laughs> what the hell? And Lisa shows up with 10 dates. No wonder JFK High was shut down and became Bayside High. It attracts 21-year-old predators like Deke. We're back to Zack being evil. <laughs> yes. Zack doesn't want to take the midterm, so clearly the next step is to set Screech's rats loose through the building. Remember, it can't simply be that. It also has to somehow screw over Miss Bliss. Miss Bliss was in the running for a Teacher of the Year award, but the rat incident has caused the school to be shut down for a week and they can't reschedule her interview. While some of the tone in Good Morning Miss Bliss may be a little different than Saved by the Bell, Zach Morris is more or less the same. He does some worse things on Saved by the Bell, but here it doesn't feel like he's a different character. He just seems like what Saved by the Bell Zach would have been like in junior high. You see the seeds being planted for his Bart Simpson with the brain of Patrick Bateman persona. And I'm not sure if Miss Bliss should get this award anyway. She has a game with the students where the prize is a shirt that says, I met the Miss Bliss challenge. <laughs> Phrasing. Well, Tina Palladrino gets a little more plot this time, other than arguing with Milo about stage space a few episodes ago. Milo still has yet to have a major plot line, but he sure was mad about those rats! Tina briefly lives with Miss Bliss when she and her boyfriend break up. That way the show can turn into Laverne and Shirley for an episode. This is one episode where it really does not feel like I'm talking about Saved by the Bell. Imagine if this were the first episode you saw in syndication. That had to be confusing. I picture my dad going, who are these teachers? Is this the show the kids are into? Why do the opening credits show Bayside High, but this is in Indianapolis? This one, however, definitely saved by the bell. The kids are trying to prank Miss Bliss, but they accidentally keep getting Mr. Belding instead. Whether it's spicing up the coleslaw or the old bucket of water dropped on the head prank. What's Miss Bliss's reaction? Oh, you kids are so funny. But then when someone gets Miss Bliss by putting paint on her chair, she puts Screech on trial to determine whether he's guilty or not. <laughs> what the hell? Why is this treated worse than Zack? playing Wall Street and causing Miss Bliss to sell her car and then getting the school shut down with rats. Oh, and the person who did it? Miss Bliss herself to teach the students about the judicial system and to terrorize Screech by falsely accusing him, I guess. I will say this, the show teaches its younger viewers about things like legal proceedings and stocks, but still, the hell kind of school is this? Oh, this one teaches a lesson too. If you make a bet with your friend that you can kiss a pop star who is giving her final appearance in the school, <laughs> just pretend like you're dying. That's what Zack does, so what's the lesson here? Mr. Belding actually believes Zack is dying. At this point, if you're still falling for Zack Morris schemes, you get what's coming to you. That's the lesson, and we're only 11 episodes in. Even when Zack finds out that Mr. Belding really does think he's dying, Zack's reaction is, <laughs> that's pretty funny. <laughs> wow! The pop star's stage name, by the way, is Stevie, and she was a former student at the school named Colleen Morton. The same last name as the creepy science teacher? Sure, she never mentions a relation, but given that she pretends to be someone else in front of Zack and seems turned on by him having the hots for Stevie, then even kisses him, she's kind of creepy too, like her dad. Oh, sorry, possible dad. There go my theories again. 
So two skeevy high school club members come to the junior high to ask Lisa and the others to a wild party they're having. Seems legit. Almost as legit as the club making Zach do college-style hazing rituals in the middle of Miss Bliss's class. They even force Zach to do jumping jacks in the middle of lunch hour. Why aren't those high school students in their own school? Oh, they're probably also 21 as they walk through the halls at this junior high and make Zach go shirt Shirtless. What? Oh, he learns a lesson when he has to choose between this gang and his friends. That is, after embarrassing the hell out of his friends first. He outs Mikey's crush, tells secrets about Lisa's makeup, shoves pie in Nikki's face, and calls Screech worthless. Couldn't he have just sat them down and been like, look guys, we need to pretend to not be friends for a few days. And eh, what's it matter? Half of them are gonna be gone next season anyway. Speaking of which, the next episode is the season finale. Will they give Miss Bliss, Milo, Nikki, and Mikey a proper exit? What a send-off! Miss Bliss's mentor dresses as Abraham Lincoln to give the Gettysburg Address, Nikki throws out a first pitch, Mikey does nothing, and Milo guards a water fountain. You see, folks, I have a much better finale in my head. In the Peter Morris episode, Miss Bliss told them, when your son graduates here, call me. So clearly, Miss Bliss and Robert Pine ran off together. As for Nikki, Mikey, and Milo, eh, they died. You know, I can see why they changed things up for the next season. This was only a 13 episode season, but it felt long. Like one of those days when I'm having to binge watch a 26 episode season. It was like two wildly different shows competing with each other. One is about the single life of a 40-something homeroom teacher, and the other is after-school special style shenanigans with the students. Good Morning Miss Bliss was canceled, but Tartikoff still saw potential in the show and sent it back to the drawing board. So which side of the show won? Teacher life or student life? Student life, of course. I remember when I asked out the tall girl in school and she grew three extra feet right in front of my eyes. So now Zach, Mr. Belding, Lisa, and Screech are in Bayside High School in California. How do you explain this since the show doesn't? Um, transfer program maybe? Good Morning Miss Bliss was reworked as Saved by the Bell and moved to Saturday mornings on NBC, which proved Brandon Tartikoff right because the show became a runaway Saturday morning success. Instantly, the show works better. The kids all have better chemistry. Their personalities stand out a lot more with their screen presence. And Mario Lopez is a great foil to Zach Morris. Without teacher plots, they're free to be way more insane with their students, to the point to where they're all hanging out in a colorful diner called The Max, run by a magician named Max. This place looks like Colby the Christian computer is gonna roll in any minute, but on with our very serious look back as Saved by the Bell. Hey, look at my Mark Brendenowitz shirt to honor the fallen members of JFK Junior High. If you don't know what Mark Brendenowitz is, well, it's a Mark Brendenowitz thing you wouldn't understand. Well, not only are we forgetting Good Morning Miss Bliss, but we're already remaking episodes. Remember when Zack and Mikey were fighting over Shanna to go to the dance? Well, who cares if you forgot it? Because in this one, Zack and Slater are fighting over Kelly to go to a dance contest hosted by Casey Kasem. Already, Good Morning Miss Bliss is looking as gritty as Dangerous Minds. I love that Slater, Jesse, and Kelly get as much of an intro here as Miss Bliss and the others got a send-off. What's the intro for these new characters? Oh, they get that later on in the season. Seriously. In this one, Zack needs help dancing, so he gets Jesse to teach him. <laughs> one episode in, and I'm already set up for a showgirls reference. <laughs> Zack's gonna dance naked! Zack is also way more psychotic now that he's in high school. In junior high, the whole thing with him, Mikey, and Shanna just seemed like a misunderstanding. In this, oh, Kelly is 
his property. And he talks to the camera now like a Saturday morning Ferris Bueller, only instead of wanting to help Cameron, it's as if he wanted him to drown in a pool. Oh shit, Lisa charged daddy's credit card $386 and has to work to get it back before he finds out? Oh, just buy potatoes like Zach did. That'd be way better than her becoming a waitress at the max and her friends throw everyone's food away early just to keep the service going. Why is Max okay with this? Also, only $386? I would've figured it'd be way more. Hillary Banks has you beat. I just assumed Lisa spent $300 bucks a week. She's also terrified of her dad finding out. In a dream sequence, he turns into Satan and yells at her. What kind of home life does she have where this is a possibility? We'll never find out because this is the only appearance that Lisa's dad makes. That's all right. Between Peter and Derek Morris, Zach has an extra dad to spare. Speaking of Zach, when Lisa tells him that she needs his help, he rips off his shirt to reveal an undershirt that has a Z on it causing him to go, this is a job for Zack Man. How long was he waiting to do this? I've been wearing this for days waiting for a predicament to happen. Does Saved by the Bell really have a shark jumping moment? This is three episodes into the Bayside years, and Screech is struck by lightning, which makes him psychic, so Zack uses this to help him cheat on his midterms, where the teacher is the Micro Machine Man. A plotline like this establishes that anything is possible in this universe. And when Screech touches a TV, it shows the school from Good Morning Miss Bliss. Was, was all of that just in an electrocuted Screech universe? Like this show's version of the Westfall universe? And Bayside has the better romance, like the slater Zack romance. Zack keeps losing bets to Slater, so Slater tells him that they now have a master-slave relationship, and he even gives Zack a slave list. Hoo-hoo, they can go shopping for leather after Zack gets treatment for his gambling addiction. Remember his bet with Nikki about whether he could kiss Stevie? Plus, when he tries getting Kelly to go to sleep so he can kiss her, he may be a date rapist too. It's been a few weeks, so clearly there needs to be another dance episode where Zack is fighting with Slater over Kelly. This time, however, it's the girls' choice dance where the girls have to ask out their crushes, unlike those other dances where the ladies are demanded to be their dates. Obviously, there's only one way to know for sure who Kelly wants. Zack and Screech break into Jesse's bedroom to bug it so they can listen in on their secrets. Look, it's a hard week for Zack. The girls get back at him by convincing him that Kelly is a serial killer. <laughs> Seriously. And he has to avoid gangs of girls asking him out, so he dresses like a sheik and puts on a funny accent. Oh my god, so problematic, you guys. Seriously? I'm kidding. If Saved by the Bell is too much for you, I would say good luck out there, but you're never going outside, let alone off Twitter. The question you should be asking is why Jessie has a framed pair of jeans on her door and windows with no glass. That's just asking for this potential slumber party massacre to get interrupted by a driller killer. Screech is awfully bummed out because girls just don't like him. Of course girls don't like him. They know that he grows up to be Shelly from Friday the 13th 3D and Jason gets his mask from him. Zack steps in to create a fictitious girl who he says is interested in Screech. No, no, he's not doing this because he cares about Screech. He's doing this so that Screech will finish he and Zack's science project. Screech takes it well. He handcuffs himself to a locker and says he's not moving until he meets this fake girl. So Zack has to dress up like the girl in order to dump him. Makes sense. So, true story, I never heard of the show Zack Morris is Trash until last week. When I teased this binge watch, I kept seeing the title of that show pop up in the comments, and about the hundredth time I saw it, I thought to myself, I should probably investigate. Sorry, I work on the internet, but I'm not an expert on internet shows. <laughs> anyway, Zack Morris is Trash is a funny show, and you should totally watch it. Although you don't need me to tell you that this late in the game. Whoa, 
Time out? It's the first episode where Zack says time out. Zack Morris is the last person who needs the ability to freeze time. That's even worse than the Hollow Man getting the power of invisibility. Why do I say this? Slater's dad wants to move to Hawaii, so Zack, in an effort to get rid of the Kelly competition, convinces the others that Slater is dying and needs treatment in Hawaii. Why do Zack's schemes always have to jump to the most extreme conclusions? This isn't the first time he's made up a terminal illness. Stop believing Zack when he says that someone's dying. And I know that Good Morning Miss Bliss still happened in this continuity. Mr. Belding mentions Indiana. What a weird student exchange program. I don't think Slater was going to move to Hawaii. I think he was going to go live on a sitcom character farm. Don't ever say that the gang aren't secret buttercreamers. When the older drama teacher throws her back out, the gang helps her by wheeling her out on a skateboard. Because 1989. It's okay though, a hot new substitute named Mr. Crane takes over the class. It's sort of like the substitute story in Good Morning Miss Bliss, only here it's the students who go all Lisa Simpson and Mr. Bergstrom on the man. And how could they not? His teeth sparkle like the great Leslie. This makes the boys super jealous and they want to get rid of Mr. Crane. They hire Bess Meyer to pretend to be Mr. Crane's fiance. You might remember her as Chandler's movie director buddy from Friends in an episode coincidentally titled The One Where Ross Dates a Student. You know, if Mr. Crane actually did make a move on the high school girls, I think your little problem of wanting to get rid of him would work itself out. Or, maybe, Slater says he's seen this problem before. What was his previous school like where the substitute teachers just macked on the girls? You know, I love that Screech is simultaneously a genius and dumb. He invents things, but also thinks that ALF is a real alien. Here, he accidentally invents a miracle face cream that instantly gets rid of zits. Translation, Zack uses this to become the school's snake oil salesman. Why bother selling this at school? This miracle cream could make you all millionaires. It got rid of all the zits on Crater Face. Now he's free to be Buddy Holly on an episode of Quantum Leap. It's no coincidence Screech is wearing a Buddy Holly shirt. Yes, it has a side effect of temporarily making your face maroon, but there's pills out there that have the side effect of suicidal tendencies, so I think you'd be fine. Okay, this is the third episode that has Zack making some kind of bet. He's lost all of the bets that I've seen him make so far. Again, this man clearly has some kind of gambling addiction. Here he bets that Slater will win his next wrestling match. Only Slater gets depressed because it's career week, and he's worried that he's going to peak in high school. So he temporarily quits sports to take home at class. Oh, he'll be fine. In the updated Saved by the Bell, he's the coach, because as the lesson in this episode points out, just worry about your career later. And by the way, one of the things that Zack bets is his dirt bike. So either he got a new one after the whole potato incident, or he did not sell it to pay back Miss Bliss, just as I predicted. <laughs> Screech invented a robot named Kevin, and it appears to have artificial intelligence. Again, how is he not rich? Why isn't this the main plot line instead of just a throwaway joke? The plot has to do with Zack getting Screech to tutor Kelly. That way she'll ace the science test and be able to go with Zack to the George Michael concert. Only, oops, she gets a crush on Screech instead of Zack. That's because she sensed that he's going to be a millionaire by the time he's 20. Still, this is the biggest news to ever hit the school. Even President Bush and Gorbachev are talking about this. Oh no, they're not talking about the robot. They're talking about the nerd dating the hot girl. Ew. She almost takes Screech to the concert, but never mind. He's into bugs and weird nerd shit. Ew. He tells her that they have nothing in common, and she walks away all sad and gives the tickets to Zack and Slater. Oh, it's not resolved after that. That's how the episode ends. 
Ooh, another economics class episode. What's the worst that could happen? The students have to come up with inventions and are even given seed money, so Zach gets them all to start a friendship bracelet business. How is this gonna lead to potatoes and the teacher having to sell their car? Zach given more money for another investment is like Bernie Madoff just having to start another business. It doesn't take long for the gang to argue and split up into two companies. Why do they even even need seed money when Kelly, Slater, and Jesse can already produce a professional looking music video to sell their buddy bands. Don't worry, Zach's group has a plan too. Make Screech a gigolo whose time can be bought with bracelets. And when that doesn't work, destroy their business by giving Mr. Belding a buddy band to make the product now seem uncool. You know, all of this could be avoided if they just simply used Screech's robot as their invention. Ever notice how sometimes when they need a substitute, Mr. Belding just takes over the class? That's a way to save money on hiring another actor. The gang learns about marriage by being paired up as married couples. I see nothing bad coming of this. Sure, sure, Screech thinks this is real and actually shows up at Lisa's house to move in, and Slater has Screech pretend to be Zack and Kelly's son so he'll break them up. I have a headache. At least with Kelly and Zack being mock married, it foreshadows the Wedding in Vegas movie. Clearly, though, the biggest problem is what the IMDb trivia says. Slater says he's gonna punch Jesse to the moon. It's a Saturday morning show threatening violence. Yeah, it's a reference to the Honeymooners, dumbasses. This episode opens with Zack telling Jesse that she's his best friend. Can't you tell? She's running for student council president, only Zack decides to run against her when he finds out that the winner gets a free trip to D.C. and no school for a week. Why would Zack want a D.C. trip? Doesn't he go on ski trips all the time? And why would he want the responsibility of being student council president when I'm sure he could just ask his dad for a trip to D.C.? It's it's the classic story about how the person qualified for the job is screwed over by an egomaniac who wins because he just wants some shit for himself. They say that everyone needs school, however, school seems to be ground zero for all of Zack's bad ideas. He's taught about subliminal messaging right when the sweetheart dance is about to happen. So of course he uses subliminal messaging via music tape to convince Kelly to go with him to the dance. Hidden messages and manipulating time are not powers that Zack should have. He's not Superman, he's Homelander from the boys. He causes a school pandemic where all the hot girls are brainwashed into going out with the nerds. <laughs> I knew this was the Screwballs universe. Also, it's important that he has Screech working for him. He has Screech dressed like a girl to sneak into the girl's locker room to plant the tape. That way, if Screech gets caught, he can be the scapegoat. <laughs> Genius! But what's it matter if Kelly doesn't go with him to the dance? What is this, like the third dance this season? And I regret saying that the season premiere was like that Good Morning Miss Bliss episode, because every episode is like that that Good Morning Miss Bliss episode. Oh, and to get revenge on Zack, even the teacher and Mr. Belding pretend to have a crush on Zack. <laughs> there are no heroes here. Well, it's great that we're watching the first episode of the Bayside Years, 15 episodes in. You know how there are times when an episode might be intended to be earlier in the season, but sometimes you really can't tell? <laughs> Not here. The first line is, so, it's the first day of school, and he even has a poster of Kelly in his room to tell us who Kelly is. It also shows us the first time he and Slater meet, when Slater is the new kid in school, and instantly they have a rivalry. 
Plus, Zack is back to being about an inch shorter and his voice a little higher because it's before his mid-season growth spurt and voice drop. And shouldn't they all be new students here? How does this accidental prequel not explain their mystery transfer from Indianapolis? I like how we're just supposed to accept this out-of-order episode placement as if it wants us to think, well, maybe I just missed the original airing. They could have at least added a Zack intro with him saying, this is what my first day of school was like. <laughs> what? They did that with the junior high years. Oh, is it the season finale already? But school just started in the previous episode. I haven't even talked about what I got for lunch during season one and season two. Honestly, I don't want to talk about it. It's 4th of July weekend, and I may have binge ate a little too much during this binge watch. My weight continuity is going to be all over the place. I just hope that I fit into my new shirt that's here to remind me of the Good Morning Miss Bliss years. Warning, watching good morning miss bliss do not disturb to which laura's reaction was ew what's he doing in there oh, hang on just give me a second to change ah here we go perfect oh sorry as for this episode uh there's a prank war between bayside and the competing school valley high careful you're gonna get screech put on trial again <laughs> just kidding but i'm sure there still will be a trial because the valley students kidnap screech under the authorization of the valley principal because the schools are like mafia families We are now beginning sophomore year at Bayside High, which means prom is here. <laughs> Wait, what? Already? This school makes no sense. Well, may as well start with a dance episode so Zack and Slater can barge into Kelly's bedroom and demand to know who she's taking to the dance. Oh, boy, does this show experiment with plot lines. Of course, there's some drama. Kelly's dad loses her job. <laughs> So she gives him her prom money, therefore cannot go to prom. Doesn't she have another dress or another outfit she could wear? She could get a $5 dress from Goodwill and still look great. Plus, she should have given her dad a proper goodbye. It's the last we see of him until the wedding in Vegas. Oh, but love is in the air everywhere in this episode. Zack and Kelly kiss, which I guess means they're together now. Plus, Slater and Jesse go to prom together. He's a jockey caveman. She's an uber feminist. Will they ever get... Uh, honestly, their chemistry is really good. Plus, Lisa and Screech go on a date. And yes, he's creepy about it. But he dumps her because she was talking during a zombie movie. Mmm, I'll allow it. In the previous episode, Zack did a very nice thing by organizing he and Kelly's private prom together. That was his one good deed of the year. Never mind romance, we are back to Psycho Zack. Belding has had enough of Zack's wisecracking in class and wants to give him 30 detentions. <laughs> wisecracking is the line? What the hell? Zack faked like two terminal illnesses. But to get out of detention, Zack agrees to join the school's army cadet program. Because, yeah, that's easier than detention. He even gets the others to join the school army, and it is much harder than they thought. Zack does not get along with the lieutenant. Plus, in the competition, they have to defeat Mr. Belding American Gladiator style. <laughs> what? Why? There's casualties, too. It's the last appearance of Alan the Nerd, so I guess he died on the front lines. This is like if Cher Horowitz wrote an officer and a gentleman. Obviously, this episode is going to be about Zack continuing with the Corps since he said cadets don't quit. Just kidding, the army class is never seen again. In this episode, Zack and Screech find an abandoned radio station in the school basement. 
as you do. We had to get to this episode to see the flashback of Belding as a 70s rocker DJ so we could explain that shot of him in the opening credits. The gang has their own radio show now, and I bet it's a great show. There's visual gags. Plus, they have to break it to Slater that he sucks on the air. This station seems like a full-time job. What about their classes? Like cadet class. And if that weren't enough plot, they use the station to help save the Max because the school board wants to shut it down. Hey, at least Ed Alonzo as Max gets his own story, which is one more than I can say about Milo on Good Morning Miss Bliss. It's the Driver's Ed episode, and I would joke that they all look 20, except that most of them actually are age-appropriate. We all just looked older back then. Personally, I think I looked older at 25 than I do now at 38. What did we grow up breathing? I guess Zack and Kelly are still dating. He gives her a ring so that when anyone says hi to her, he can say, hey, hey, see the ring? Also, Slater fixes up an old school classic automobile. I hope that this has opposite Arnie Cunningham effect and he turns into a nerd. Hey, if Zack could do that, he would. He tries sabotaging Slater here by telling Mr. Tuttle that Slater is cocky and wants to teach the class himself, so now the teacher hates him. Why do they keep believing Zach Morris, and why would Mr. Tuttle fail Slater at Driver's Ed just for thinking he's a dick? My Driver's Ed teacher, Mr. Marty Tadlow, was awesome. He was like having Joe Pesci as a teacher. He was vulgar as hell. We all loved him. He didn't care when we stole the practice go-kart and crashed it into a locker, causing Kelly to fake amnesia to teach Zach a lesson, large Usually because we didn't have a class go-kart. Everything else, though, totally happened. It's the first and only appearance of Ruth Buzzy as Screech's mom, and that casting makes total sense. Screech has the place to himself because obviously Mrs. Powers is off to a weekend orgy with all the other single appearance parents. And that's totally normal compared to the other relationship in this. Tori Spelling plays Violet, the nerdy girl who's really into Screech, only she's currently dating another nerd named Maxwell Nerdstrom. Guessing there's no jocks in that family. Nerdstrom calls Tori Spelling his squaw, screams at her for talking to someone else, and orders her to always stand next to him. But never mind that mass shooter. They have a party over at Screech's as an excuse to have a risky business reference and a plot where they accidentally break Mrs. Powers' Elvis statue as if it's a Fabergé egg with a scratch on it. And somehow Nerdstrom comes across as the biggest monster in an episode which features Zack betting Screech's dog in a poker match and losing. In this one, we find out that apparently Zack once sold the school to the Japanese. How the hell is there not an episode about that? And he gets a suspension for too many detentions and, you know, selling the school to the Japanese. It's okay, he gets out of suspension by agreeing to take out Belding's niece. What, was Ted Bundy unavailable? But oh no, the date with Belding's niece is the same day as Kelly's birthday party. If Zack shows up at the party with Belding's niece, Kelly will dump him. So instead, he makes Screech pretend to be him and go on the date with Belding's niece instead. Because that's way easier than just explaining the situation to Kelly. Even Jessie is having dating problems. In a dream sequence, she envisions being set up on a date with Teddy Krueger, Mason Vore, he's and I'm not even kidding Donald Chump oh but reality is way worse she goes to the party with Carla's son Anthony from Cheers only gasp he's way too short dude you just gotta be like me and look taller on the internet <laughs> <laughs> See, I knew it. My Peter Morris theory was accurate. Okay, okay. So this is the first appearance of Zach's dad, Derek Morris. Mr. Belding needs to see Mr. Morris because of Zach's grades. So Zach hires an actor to play his dad. <laughs> See, he's done this kind of thing before. That explains Peter Morris. And he can't get Peter Morris again because clearly he and Miss Bliss are living a nice, happy life together. And who does he hire? Okay, okay. This episode is a lot to process. 
He hires a waiter at the Max named James, who is played by Mark Blankfield of TV's Fridays and Navin Johnson in The Jerk 2. Obviously, this means that the existence of The Jerk 2 was a giant scheme by Zack to sabotage the follow-up program, The New Show. Zack Morris is a monster. What did Lorne Michaels ever do to him? Discussions of sexism come up when it's the annual Bayside High beauty pageant. I'm not exactly sure that's the biggest issue here, seeing how Jesse says, we have a woman on the Supreme Court, and yet Mr. Belding still wants us to parade around in swimsuits. Oh, and Belding hosts the competition too, and he's upset when Jesse comes out in an overcoat instead of a bathing suit. Um, hi, uh, <laughs> What? Is this whole beauty pageant just a police sting operation? That's enough to even forget Zack's gambling addiction, which is on display here too. He bets Slater that he can make Screech the Miss Bayside winner. Who cares about that? Kevin the Robot is in this episode. He doesn't just have AI, but he also drinks all of Zack's root beer. Screech could win this beauty pageant and a Nobel Prize. And yet he still thinks Alf is a real alien as he references again in this episode. No wonder everyone's ignoring Jesse's pageant protest. There's robots and gambling here. We have no time for Jesse inventing hashtags, which she enters the pageant anyway because, as she says, who wouldn't win against Screech? What a loser! Slater enters the contest too, which is the perfect opportunity for Zack to start spreading around a rumor that Slater beat the crap out of Screech. He's got to win that bet. And speaking of addiction... Eh, there's nothing to talk about with this episode, so best to move on. Okay, okay, I'm kidding. This is the very special episode in which Jesse is addicted to caffeine pills. Which I think at this point makes me the last person online to talk about this one. The show's producers originally wanted her to be on speed to address the pressures that some students face when becoming obsessed about getting into college. But the network thought that was way too hard of a drug for Saturday. Saturday morning, plus Carlton from Fresh Prince already bogarted that stash. Apparently, they only changed the name of the pill in the script and not the effect that it has on her. So in this universe, caffeine pills are the same thing as speed. I love that this drama still has something to do with Zack. Jesse is behind on her grades and also in keeping up with their all-girl group, Hot Sunday, produced by Zack to make them music stars. I love very special episodes because in the same 20 minutes that has Jesse's I'm so excited freak out, we have a scene in which Screech dresses like a woman to secretly record the girls singing in the locker room. And all it takes is a drug addiction for Zack to be a good friend. <laughs> when Jesse is crying in his arms, he has this look on his face like, whoa, whoa, where's the shenanigans? This is out of our wheelhouse. This is hard primetime drama here. Now if only we could cure Zack's gambling addiction. Now that Jesse has kicked the caffeine pill addiction, we are back to shenanigans. Oh, thank God. Zack is put in charge of the failing school store, so naturally only one thing can be done. He and Screech secretly take pictures of the girls at the swimming pool so that they can make and sell a calendar. Whoa, ho, ho. someone helped the tri lambs at their pie-eating stand. Between the beauty pageant and the secret swimsuit calendar, it's nice to have a school which caters directly to the creepy guy in his van across the street with binoculars. It's the only city where being on the sex offender list is a welcome invitation to come inside. Seriously, the girls are picked up by a photographer at a fashion magazine, and do I want to know the real reason he found that calendar? He comes into the Mac saying, whoa, look at these hot girls, and when Mr. Belding sees his face put on Jesse's body, he says, whoo, whoo, what a hottie. Ew. And then Kelly wins a trip to Paris for for a photo shoot, which Zack instantly wants to sabotage, because if she goes to Paris for a month, she'll forget all about him. In fairness to Zack, though, it's probably best he sabotages this trip. This seems like the kind of trip that leads directly to Epstein Island. 
The previous episode ended happily with Kelly going off to Paris for a month to pursue her modeling, which means that's never mentioned again, and she's still in this episode, business as usual. Maybe the trip was called off due to Ghislaine Maxwell's arrest. Zack needs the girls here. He has a new scheme to start a school 1-900 number, which surprisingly isn't a phone sex line. It's a teen advice line, which leads to Kelly's 7th grade sister being being in love with Zack, and then Jesse thinking that Zack is secretly seeing the girl. <laughs> what? He even starts giving bad advice, that way people want to call in more and then rack up the price. Okay, forget that, I have other questions. Jesse is upset that Slater hasn't asked her out on a second date after prom, you know, Prom, the season premiere, that was 10 episodes ago. Weird to be bringing that up now, months later, except this is obviously a case of the prom episode was supposed to air much later in the season and not the season premiere. Anyway, Zach doesn't go for 13-year-old Nikki because he's in love with Kelly, which, okay, good, thank God. Speaking of out of order, Close Encounters of the Nerd Kind was originally supposed to be in Season 1, but was held off until Season 2. In case you couldn't tell by Zack and Screech's voices being a smidge higher, plus their hair is a little different, and Ed Alonzo is still in the opening credits. Why in the world would they hold this one off? <laughs> okay, let's explain the plot. They break Belding's camera while filming a shot on Shidio movie about an alien Screech, Jesse dresses up like a Spanish foreign exchange student, and the government thinks that Screech is a real alien because they used a movie still shot to win a contest. Are you still with me? To win $10,000, they have to convince the world's dumbest government agent that Screech really is an alien, and then Screech hides out in Zack's bedroom to avoid dissection. You know, when I say it out loud, this sounds really stupid. I can't imagine why this was held off for another season. I realize this is quite the bar, but this may be the dumbest episode of Saved by the Bell. Okay, well, maybe Close Encounters of the Nerd Kind was the dumbest episode. The gang all learns about their ancestry. For instance, Lisa finds out her great-grandfather was a slave, and Jesse's was a slave trader. Or as Screech puts it, Underground Railroad? Does this mean Lisa's grandfather ran a Civil War subway train? But the main plot is that Zack finds out that he's of Native American heritage, which he celebrates by putting Screech in warp paint and making him act like a barbarian with a tomahawk in front of class. That's before he learns his lesson. After he learns his lesson, he dresses like Chief Alinawick to give a presentation. It's a good thing Jessie discovered white guilt in her plot. She'd hate this episode. And that's before Slater calls Screech a twink. I think I already have enough to say about this episode. Oh right, Zack's friend Old Chief Henry dies, which makes Zack too depressed to run track until the spirit of Chief Henry visits Zack in a vision. That makes no sense, since when does Zack run track? I think I spoke too soon earlier. This may be the dumbest... Uh, uh, no, Close Encounters of the Nerd Kind is still dumber. Oh no, we have another episode that's a holdover from season one. I may need to stop calling episodes the dumbest. I'm almost terrified to find out what happens in this one. Or maybe they had to go back to season one, because after the previous episode, Bayside High has been cancelled. And this one's not that far out. Zack is stuck babysitting Kelly's baby brother during class because she's busy taking yearbook photos. What kind of shitty parents does Kelly have? How is this even a predicament? They even have to hide the baby amongst the dolls in homemaking class, which leads to the baby going missing. Now that may seem dumb, but we are in a post-government agent thinks Screech is an alien universe. This ain't that dumb. Step up your dumb game out of order episodes, and I realize that this is still an episode that ends with the baby's first word being Zack. 
now I know why they had to fill in some older episodes. They had to take their time off to paint the lockers from red to yellow. And their new hairstyles suggest that they are back from mid-season break. <laughs> Just a theory. Speaking of theories, okay, so the mean Mr. Dickinson orders them to all pass his impossible test or they aren't allowed to go on a class trip. When they're all studying, Dickerson appears to them in various illusions to taunt them. Only they all see the same illusions, which means Dickerson is a warlock and these visions are real. Look, I need something else to talk about. This is another substitute teacher episode where this time the substitute is Mr. Belding's ultra cool younger brother who the gang all prefers over the lame Mr. Belding. Ew, Mr. Belding wants them to learn and shit. How cool is Rod Belding? Rod actor Ed Blatchford later appeared as himself in a 2010 short film Saved by the Belding about the search for Rod Belding. I am of the opinion that every one-time sitcom character should have a short film spin-off. It was good of the previous episode to have a nice ending where Rod abandons the students on their trip to go off with the stewardess and Zack and Mr. Belding have a good heart-to-heart -heart about Mr. Belding being the better Belding. Anyway, in this episode, Zack wants to dump Kelly because he's in love with the school nurse. I'm assuming Kelly forgave him since, again, judging by the hairstyles, this one was filmed way earlier than most of the episodes episodes this season. This whole plot is like something out of Skinamax. Zack fantasizes about the nurse, but even outside of the fantasies, her regular nurse uniform is like a costume she would get in the sexy department at a spirit Halloween. They even teach Zack a lesson by the nurse putting on an even sexier outfit to fake seduce Zack because she wants to cheat on her husband. She even corners him and says, do you want a girl or a woman? Because because we're in the Screwballs universe now. Sure, this is certainly a Zach Morris' trash episode, but this is also a There Are No Heroes Here episode. And now the lockers are orange? Why do they keep showing older episodes to repaint the lockers? Just pick a color. The placement is all weird. The previous episode ended with Kelly turning down Zack for being a bastard, but this one opens with them all lovey-dovey and saying that they've been going steady for 60 days. Honestly, though, I'm way more into the Jesse Slater love story. He's the dumb misogynistic jock. She's the humorless snob. They're the Sam and Diane of high school. School. It makes sense that they start going steady in this episode because their chemistry is really good. Like, really, really good. They have the best couples chemistry on the show. Zack and Kelly certainly seem like a sitcom couple, but Slater and Jesse have, are they hooking up off camera chemistry? Zack is doing things like trying to control who she can hang out with and saying that if she talks to her ex-boyfriend again, he'll dump her. But when Slater and Jesse fight, it's with maximum cheers, are you as turned on as I am energy. More than I can say about Belding and his wife, he's having marital problems, so he confides in the boys by hanging out in Zack's room with the rest of the gang. It's when Belding chills out in Zack's bed that I'm starting to think that this school has a boundaries problem. So that's why this episode is back to back with the sexy nurse who lessen seduces the students. Oh right, Tori Spelling is back as Screech's girlfriend. I forgot that they did end up together the last time we saw them episodes ago, and she hasn't been mentioned since then. Oh, they're still together by the end of this one, so clearly she isn't seen again until episode 7 of season 3. This is another Zack really wants a vacation episode, so he gets them all to join the Glee Club, where the prize is a trip to Hawaii. Again, I think he could just ask his dad for a vacation. In the episode where he hired a fake dad, he was rewarded with a fishing trip. Plus, they all go to Hawaii in 1992. Oh, and this is the season finale, so bye, sophomore year, I guess. Whatever. 
There is a twist here, I suppose. Screech is immune to Zack's freezing time abilities. And I don't know why, I just assume it has something to do with the robot. Eh, I gotta get back to my McNuggets meal. I went to go get fast food, which seems appropriate when doing a Saved by the Bell binge watch. It's the beginning of junior year. Do you think there's going to be a dance? Well, dance is in the title of the episode. Sorry if I seem grumpy. I got off easy with the previous seasons being only 13 to 18 episodes long. This season is 26 episodes. I wonder how many of those were shot for previous seasons. Might as well. The plots are similar. Kelly needs money for the dance, so she gets a job waitressing at the max. And then Lisa sues her for stealing one of her old plot lines. But uh-oh, Kelly gets a crush on the Max manager, Jeff. Careful, it could be Max doing a magic trick to turn himself into Patrick Muldoon. So of course Zack is super jealous, but I think there's bigger issues here, like the adult manager crushing on his teen employees to the point to where they kiss. Saturday morning TV in the 90s. Kiss your adult boss, underage ladies, so long as he's hot. Hell, Zack and Kelly break up at the end of the episode, and he is super cool about it. Or is he? It does say to be continued. And it may be too soon to make Jesse the lead singer in Zack's band Zack Attack, considering the caffeine pill thing. Yes, yes, it will be continued, but uh, in episode three. This is also the Malibu season, where the gang gets a summer job at a beach club, and for the next six weeks, a Malibu episode would air directly after a Bayside episode in an hour-long block. That's, that's just great. There actually is a breakup plotline going on, but we gotta take time out for High School Musical 2. It's gonna be a shenanigans-filled summer. Their boss, Mr. Carosi, is played by Ernie Pumba Sabella, and Zack has the hots for his daughter, Stacy, played by Leah Romini. She works at the resort, too, and she and Zack immediately start butting heads. She dares to not put up with any of Zack's shit, though she does save Zack's birthday party. Gee, I can't imagine why Kelly was driven into the arms of Jeff the manager. Anyway, back to the whole Zack and Kelly breakup plot. I appreciate that they're dedicating more time and plot to a Saved by the Bell breakup than they ever did on a Big Bang Theory breakup. All right, I've got a lot to say here. You know, if you take away the legally questionable age difference, Jeff is kind of a better catch for Kelly than Zack, at least at first. If this were a movie, Jeff would be the heroic lead, and Zack would be the douchey villain boyfriend who the girl has to break up with at some point. Remember when Zack tried using subliminal messaging to get her to ask him out? And the rest of the gang all hates Jeff. They call him a babe stealer, and they're pissed at Kelly for ruining Zack's life by daring to go out on dates with her boyfriend. I'm sorry, are we forgetting about the time when Zack dumped her because he had the hots for the school nurse? But then he uses a girl to get even with Kelly by dancing to he and Kelly's song at the max. This makes the group very angry. It was their idea for Zack to use the girl like this. What did they think was going to happen? These are all terrible friends. You know, I should be annoyed that for the next few episodes we're going to be cutting back to the Malibu episodes, but Leah Ramini is really great here. She's an excellent foil for Zack, in like a Sam and Rebecca on Cheers kind of way. I don't know if that makes me care that Zack is blackmailing Mr. Carosi because Mr. Carosi makes a bet on their volleyball team winning, and Zack uses that to bring down the price of a car he wants to buy. That was a lot of plot. Where was I going with that? Oh, right. I may not care about all of that plot, but Leah Remini does make everything better. Though I am concerned that Screech tried getting a preschooler on their team by luring them with candy. Okay. By the way, Zack gets a 6'10 ringer for the team by telling him that he can set the guy up on a date with Kelly. So, 
Okay, when is this taking place? It can't be between sophomore and junior years because Zack and Kelly aren't together in Malibu, so I guess it's in the future between junior and senior years? Hey, why not? They jump back and forth in time in a regular season anyway. Sometimes this episode is called The Surgery, and then other times it's called Operation Zack. I guess calling it The Surgery is better, since really, couldn't any episode be called Operation Zack? So not only is Zack on the basketball team now, but he's also the team captain. Zack Morris, a member of every single extracurricular school activity, so long as the plot calls for it. For instance, Belding accidentally knocks over Zack, so he needs surgery on his knee or else he can't play in the big game. That's okay, it seems like the team does fine without Zack every other game. Just like in Zack's vision of a world with a dead Zack, they all honor his locker during a funeral, but <laughs> I think they'll be fine. Plus, I know why he's injured. It's so he can be flirty with the sexy nurses who come in to rub his shoulders. I understand Zack's nurse fetish, considering even the nurses at the hospital are dressed in outfits from the sexy Halloween department. Anyway, back to the summer job. It's 4th of July weekend and all the girls enter the Miss Liberty pageant. Between Bayside High and the Malibu Resort, what is with every organization in this universe having a beauty pageant? Zack's under a lot of pressure, though. Mr. Carosi wants Judge Zack to make his daughter Stacy the winner of the pageant, but that will upset the rest of his friends who are also in the pageant. Between trying to rig a pageant and betting on the volleyball team, I'm not so sure Mr. Carosi should be employed at this resort. Plus, given Zack and Stacy's newfound romance, should he even be a judge? He ends up voting for Kelly in the pageant, and yeah, sure, that'll go over fine. Voting for your ex-girlfriend in a pageant that your current love interest is in? They almost don't go to the dance together, but then they make up and kiss, as if it would have mattered anyway. There's probably 12 dances left this season. You know what else is the same in the summer and school years? <laughs> Betting. Screech goes off to the National Chess Championship against Valley, so of course Zack and Slater have to make a $300 bet about Screech winning. There's even kidnapping when Zack and Slater beat the shit out of Screech's opponent and keep him in the closet. <laughs> Netflix did a documentary about the wrong mafia. There's more betting in this series than there is Screech's girlfriend, Violet. Oh, right. She's in this episode, too, where she gives Screech her lucky beret to wear. These chess championships are harsh. Valley sends in a girl to hit on Screech in order to take his lucky beret and also break up he and Violet. And that'll get rid of his good luck charm. Screech and Violet are still together by the end of the episode. Not that it matters, because she is never seen again. That way, Screech can go back to being in love with Lisa, even though that hasn't been mentioned since the movie theater incident. Back in Malibu, this is the one where they're all eating leftover buffalo wings while shipping out some DVD orders from our eBay store. Oh wait, that's just what I was doing while this episode was on. It's okay, I looked up long enough to see Screech being chased by super soakers. That was a nice nostalgic throwback. I had the big blue ones, not the popular neon ones that were in all of the commercials. Oh, and there's some drama too. Zack and Stacy are together, but then her boyfriend Craig comes back. What? She was seeing someone else? It's hard to get mad at someone when I can 100% see Zack doing it. Hell, her boyfriend Craig gives her a pin and says she's mine forever. The kind of villain Craig is, is kind of what Zack is in the whole Zack, Jeff, and Kelly triangle. I bet Zack and Stacy will still end up together. It's them that get married in Vegas later on, right? Speaking of bad boyfriends that pretty much do the same things as Zack, the gang all gets fake IDs in order to get into an 18 plus nightclub. All the celebrities are there, including the pizza guy from Home Alone. They catch Kelly's boyfriend Jeff cheating on her, and there is a good lesson here. Girls, 
Careful not to trust your adult age boss who begins dating you when you're 16. Now granted, just because Jeff is sleazy doesn't mean that Zack is a good catch. Hello, nurse incident. I will always remind you of the nurse incident. Everyone makes mistakes here. They tell Zack that he should be the one to tell Kelly about Jeff's cheating, and she instantly doesn't believe him. Almost like anyone else should have been the one to tell her. Plus, Jeff and Kelly's breakup must have been extra hard, since I guess Jeff quits his job at the max over it. <laughs> he is also never seen again. Anyway, in Malibu, I really shouldn't be getting mad since this is one of the many episodes written by Bennett Tramer. I knew that the making of Saved by the Bell took place in the David Gordon Green Halloween universe. Stacy's put in charge of the resort when Mr. Carosi leaves for the day, but oh no, the kitchen staff goes on strike and there's two simultaneous parties going on. The gang has to cook for all of these people while Screech and Lisa go searching for buried treasure on the beach. Five episodes into the six-episode Malibu arc, and I already think they're running out of ideas. There's a buried treasure plotline! Maybe instead of searching for buried treasure, Screech should realize that his bedroom alone houses billion-dollar inventions. Okay, maybe I missed the lighthearted Malibu episodes now because this is the caffeine pills episode of the season. Oil is discovered at the school and the gang all dreams of becoming millionaires, only that's not quite what happens. Instead, an oil company comes in to drill on school property and someone shot Mr. Burns. Not quite. Jesse wants to stop the oil company, but Zack wants to be so rich that he could have a cheerleader in every locker. But oops, an oil spill happens that destroys the school pond and kills Zack's beloved duck, Becky, who Zack nursed back to health and bonded with after a baseball incident. Sorry to interrupt the Malibu episodes. Here's one where Zack is holding the dead body of Becky the Duck covered in oil. It is a legit sad scene though, and it doesn't sugarcoat the situation. The episode spends a lot of time with Becky the Duck, easily making the audience fall in love with her before killing her. <laughs> Between environmental issues and drug addiction, points for the show keeping it real on Saturday mornings. So long, Malibu episodes, but we still got plenty more Saved by the Bell to get through. Between the 13 Miss Bliss episodes, the 19 College Years episodes, and the 86 Bayside episodes, I think we're at the halfway point, give or take. Say hello if you're still watching! Since this is the last of the six-episode Malibu arc, we have to say goodbye to Stacy and Mr. Carosi. Clearly, Stacy marries Doug Heffernan, and Mr. Carosi goes crazy and becomes the naked subway man on Seinfeld. Since this is just a summer love, though, Zack and Stacy have to say goodbye. That way, they can sing Summer Lovin' at wherever they're going next. Sure, sure, Stacy and Mr. Carosi are never seen again, but my question is, if this is taking place in the future, are Jesse and Slater still together here? He saves his secret admirer, Denise Richards, and they go to a luau together, and Jesse says nothing about them hooking up. Do they break up this season? I take my Saved by the Bell continuity very seriously. Almost as seriously as I take my facial hair continuity in this video. Uh, one episode after the Malibu story, and I already miss Stacy Carosi. She and Zack did have pretty good chemistry. She was no-nonsense and didn't put up with any of Zack's shit. And when they said they loved each other, it felt genuine. Zack and Stacy make more sense to me than Zack and Kelly do. Sorry, I'm going to have to deal with this loss on my own time, because the show is a psychological thriller now. Jesse's mom gets married, and she has a new stepbrother, Eric, who is a walking, talking sex offender profile. He wants to 
to share Jesse's bedroom, stalks the shit out of Lisa, wants to watch Jesse change her clothes, and gets into a car accident with Lisa in Belding's car. How is there all of this other stuff to talk about in an episode where Zack pretends to be Jewish so he can go to a baseball game? Hell, there's a part two! The gang is in big trouble. It was Zack's plan for Lisa and Eric to take out Belding's car. That way, Zack could blackmail Eric. And now they've crashed it! Again, Zack once sold the school to the Japanese. I think he'll be fine. But could Eric, a Saturday morning version of Jess from Gilmore Girls, actually have a heart of gold? Maybe he was just moody because his last name is Tramer, and he's not over the death of his brother Ben. And given that Bennett is Kelly's brother's name, this whole series is a love letter to Halloween 2's Ben Tramer. As for Eric Tramer, he actually is getting along with Lisa. Maybe he's a changed man. Well, sort of. Jesse awesomely punches him across the face, and then he fixes the car himself, and the gang wants him to stay at Bayside instead of going back to New York. It's nice they have a new friend <laughs> he's never seen again. The school needs $600 for cheerleader uniforms, so clearly the only logical solution is date auction. You know, if they would finally legalize prostitution, the school wouldn't need to strike oil to be rich. That would have spared Zack the horror of an overweight girl winning him in the auction. Oh good, Zack is back to being the original Eric Tramer. Zack tries desperately hard to get out of this date. Ew, fat girl, so embarrassing! He even pretends to throw his back out so he doesn't have to dance with her. Dude, this is just a date auction. You're not an actual gigolo. You don't have to have sex together. Hell, this doesn't even mean you're both a couple. Everyone's like this. Jesse threatens the other girls not to bet on Slater. Oh, I'd listen to her. I remember that scene from Showgirls where she kicked the rapist's face in. <laughs> Not for nothing, that was my favorite scene from Showgirls. She is really good at being intimidating. I'm surprised it took this long to have a whole episode that takes place in a mall. The gang finds $5,000 in a shopping bag. Obviously, they should hold on to this for the next time that they need money and have to resort to a date auction or fixing Belding's car. Sure, sure, there's gangsters after them, but this could be foreshadowing the wedding in Vegas, whose plot also includes the phrase, and then gangsters are after them. Look, I've got other things to worry about other than gangsters going after Bayside students. I've simultaneously been dealing with a copyright issue on the Passion of the Christ video from a company that really wants to take this to the bitter end. Thank God this is happening on a 26 episode day. And yes, I looked up at the screen long enough to notice that the whole gangster money bag thing was just a candid camera episode. Oh, they caught the gang doing so much illegal shit. Yes, Mark Blankfield's James is back and working at the Max. I guess they needed another employee after the strange disappearance of Jeff and Max. I honestly really like seeing Mark Blankfield pop up in things. The Jerk 2 was really bad, but everything else I see him in, he's great, especially in Robin Hood Men in Tights. Here, when they hire him to pretend to be a Harvard recruiter to make other recruiters jealous, he is really damn funny. Sorry, here I am talking about James when the gang is taking their SATs and Jessie does not do as well as she had hoped. Bet she wishes she had those caffeine pills now. Oh, they'll be fine. I didn't take my SATs and look at me. I'm talking about Saved by the Bell on YouTube. Do I even mention that Zach has the hots for Christine Taylor in this episode? And do I also need to mention that she's never seen again? Oh, are you missing the Malibu Beach episodes? Well, good for you, because here's a two-part Palm Springs episode. It's been days since they've been on vacation. Er, uh, well, maybe. Okay, so the Malibu episodes are taking place during their upcoming summer, but here, Slater is super into this girl that he meets at the hotel, 
But back at school, he and Jesse are still together. Are all of these vacation episodes in a separate timeline? I expect serious continuity details in a plot that has Slater in love with a girl who turns out to be the princess of a fictitious country. <laughs> that happens. And Jesse has other stuff to worry about, like her dad marrying a much younger woman and Jesse is pissed. She needs to lighten up. Her stepbrother is a missing person and she could use a new stepmom. Or could she? I guess not, since Jessie tries sabotaging her dad's wedding because, ew, young wife! This is really ruining the romantic mood of Zack and Kelly possibly getting back together. That's right, sparks are igniting and on vacation, too. They should have brought Christine Taylor with them so that Kelly could talk her into shaving her head. Oh, Jessie's doing enough sabotaging here, like trying to drown her father's fiancé in a swim race and then calling her a gold digging bimbo on their wedding day. She really needs to give her dad a break. He is arguably a member of the Single Appearance Parents Club. Two-part episode. I'll allow it. Anyway, Zach and Kelly don't get back together. Not that relation continuity means anything in the vacation episodes. See? Jesse and Slater are still together in this episode, when Jesse is super jealous that Slater may be into a girl who is trying out for wrestling. Oh, but she wasn't jealous when Slater was literally dating a princess in the previous episode? Despite, you know, the princess never being seen again. Speaking of never seen again, the students all stage a protest so that Christy, the new girl, can try out for wrestling. This is after the coach says, hey, if you want to wrestle a girl, date him, and Mr. Bell uses his radio show to talk about girls wrestling. <laughs> you know, that's still not as bad as Zach literally doing his show live in the girls' locker room. And that jealousy actually makes Jesse say that women do not belong in sports. <laughs> if she were a real feminist, I think she'd be a little upset that Mr. Belding also goes into the girls' locker room after Zach. Oh, did I say that the oil episode was the caffeine pills episode of the season? Well, that one was the very special episode of the season, but this one does have drugs in it. Though it's not every day that you see a Saturday morning series bring up the deaths of Len Bias and John Belushi, and also features NBC executive Brandon Tartikoff as himself. <laughs> this really was a passion project for him. So a young movie star wants to do an anti-drug PSA based but then it turns out that he himself is on drugs. I honestly do like the fact that they address that a lot of those young stars that did cheesy anti-drug ads were themselves on drugs. It's like a cheesy just say no special that's kind of self-aware while also being a cheesy just say no ad. It ends with the characters looking directly into the camera and saying, would I use dope? Nope, there's no hope in dope. And then when they find out that the movie star Johnny Dakota is on drugs, they all walk out on him like he's a loser and Zack even gives him his jacket back. <laughs> yeah, that'll get him off drugs. Oh, what's this now? Zack dreams of his band, Zack Attack, becoming huge music stars, complete with a documentary hosted by Casey Kasem. I guess Jessie has no place in this dream since she's not in the episode due to breaking her knee before filming. Gina Gershon got revenge for being pushed down the stairs, didn't she? I like that it foreshadowed Dustin Diamond doing a tell-all since in the episode Screech gives a tell-all interview to a reporter. Unfortunately, the Zack attack falls apart due to infighting with the band, something that I feel would happen regardless of any kind of success. I'm surprised that even at school Zack didn't dress like Vanilla Ice and that Screech didn't worship the High Wise Sage Geek, played by sequel George McFly. And that's the story about how Zack and friends became Dragon Sound from Miami Connection and sang about friendship. Now we're back to normal. It's cut day at school, but Zack can't cut because if he gets a 
tenth detention? Well, that's a suspension. Plus, Belding has been taking some cues from Ed Rooney. If Zack skips, Belding will break into his house. And of course, there's money riding on this when Zack bets Slater that he can still cut school. You know, if the college years didn't exist, I would just assume that Zack would be in far too much debt to even go to college to begin with. Having to come up with a scheme to sneak out of every class and then coming back in time for the beginning of the next class seems like a far bigger headache than just staying in school for the day. 90% of the students are all gone, so the teachers all give them free days. This doesn't seem so bad. It's way worse outside of class. Jesse and Slater agree to start seeing other people. I know, I've seen the Malibu and Palm Springs episodes. Speaking of multi-part episodes, we got another two-parter, this one on Christmas break. My god, this season feels so long. I'm so tired. It's the holidays and the gang all starts working at the mall where things are so tense that some woman tries strangling Slater because he dropped her champagne glasses. Plus, Home Alone was really big at the time, so there has to be a homeless man, though it is still saved by the bell, so Zack has a crush on the homeless man's daughter. I could sum up my thoughts on the episode now, but there is 40 minutes worth of story here, I guess. Frank the homeless man passes out in the middle of the store and has to be rushed to the hospital where Zack, dressed as Santa, finds out that daughter Laura is also homeless. Okay, it can't be a coincidence that Hulu shows a Dawn soap ad that has someone washing oil off of a duck. <laughs> Wrong episode, but correct season. I know I should be paying attention to Frank and Laura's story about being homeless, but I'm too busy looking at photos to see if Zack's living room is the same living room set used in the map Foley sketches on Saturday Night Live. They look very similar. It all ends well, though. The ending credits say Santa as himself. So I guess Santa Claus is real in this universe. Kelly saves Laura when she's accused of stealing, and they all spend Christmas together where they can stay with Zack until Frank can find himself another job. Given that neither Frank or Laura are ever seen again, I'm assuming that they either died or or are living off of royalties from inspiring Curly Sue. It's the season finale, and it is so late at night. This season felt so long, especially with the six-episode Malibu arc and all the two-parters that were thrown in there. It's the end of junior year, which means murder mystery? The gang wins a murder mystery weekend at a mansion where there may be a real killer? Wouldn't it be something if this were the series finale and it turned into a slasher film where Jesse is the only survivor? That's not any better than here, where Zack is accused of theft and murder and is thrown thrown under the bus by all of his friends. They all say things like, Zack couldn't kill anyone, though he did steal Belding's car. Oh, there's not really a murder, by the way. It was all just part of the game, which involved framing Zack. Remember when this show was about the single life of a junior high school teacher? That's right, it's taken me so long to watch this that it's the Christmas season now. I don't think that this video will be quite as long as the five and a half hour Friends episode. Although it might, because here is another season that is also 26 episodes long. My god, it was such a long day watching the last season, and I have a feeling I'm going to be very tired at the end of this season too. I never thought I would say this, but I am so sick of watching Saved by the Bell. <laughs> well, it's senior year, but at least it's a season premiere that actually takes place on the first day back to school. When they did this in season one, they aired the episode towards the end of that season. But why am I upset? It's such a unique episode. Zack and Slater are fighting over a girl. <laughs> it was somewhere around Slater showing up at Zack's house to interrupt Zack's study date by using a vacuum to suck up all of his notes that I thought, yeah, I'm Team Zack on this one. That makes his retaliation later on at the movie theater fair game. 
And it's worth it to see Zack and Slater get in a full-on fist fight in the hallway. I don't really know why they're fighting. Not only is Joanna, their love interest, never seen again, but neither is Derek, the freshman that Lisa is dating, and Belding's toupee isn't seen again either. It's student teacher week, which means a handful of students switch places with a handful of teachers. And by a handful of students, I just mean our main characters. To teach Zack a lesson, Mr. Belding makes Zack the principal. What's the worst that could happen? Zack's first order of business, he wants the peephole in the girls' locker room to be enlarged. Which means there's already a peephole in the girls' locker room. Plus, he has all the hot girls sent to the office to find out if they're single or not. If Zack keeps this up, he could run a movie studio in the 90s. Then teacher Kelly is shocked when Zack screws over her teaching job. She even says to him, I thought you were special. Why? That's like when she said to Jeff, I left a really great guy for you. Did you? Mr. Belding teaches the communications course, which again, saves money on hiring another actor. The gang all creates a school TV news program, and I remember when we did this in my communications class. It was really raunchy, like Kentucky Fried Movie. We couldn't show it in class, and we only recorded it when the teacher was out of the room. We are very lucky we didn't get caught. This episode, however, is totally a real high school experience. Screech's spaghetti sauce is so delicious that they decide to make a business out of it. Why not? All of their other businesses were successful. But Soleil Moonfry goes out with Screech and she's just using him for his sauce. Let it go. He needs this. Especially after his previous girlfriend, Tori Spelling, disappeared off the face of the planet. And at least in this, Soleil Moonfry isn't punching him a lot like like she did Joey. Oh, now I know why this season is so long. It involves an alternate universe in which Jesse and Kelly don't exist, and instead we have Liana Creel as biker chick Tori, the new girl in school. Don't worry, they don't redo Zack and Slater fighting over the same girl again. Instead, Zack and Tori hate each other, which means they'll sort of end up together some episodes down the road, so they're redoing the Zack and Leah Romini storyline. So Tori was introduced into the show because they needed to replace Jesse and Kelly since they didn't sign up for an extended season. See? Even they admit this season is too long. And I'm guessing they really don't exist in the Tori universe. Lisa says to Tori, you're my only best friend. Where the hell did they go? Is this why characters just disappear all the time? Are there multiple universes here? Speaking of the Leah Romini episodes, much like how those were aired, this season would air one episode in the Tori universe alongside an episode in the regular timeline. Cause, you know, you don't want to get confusing. You know, we've had too much Zack and Slater fighting over a girl over the years. Let's change that up a bit. Here, Zack gets really close with Lisa, which makes Screech super jealous. You know, thinking about it, Zack and Lisa kind of makes sense as a couple. They're both very shallow, materialistic, and ambitious. Too bad this whole romance isn't mentioned again until an episode of The New Class. They ruined the 200th fashion show of the series for no reason. And then there was the time Zack took out a girl that he met on a helpline, but then was shocked to find out, oh no, she's in a wheelchair. He's weirded out at first, but then overcompensates how cool he is with the situation by constantly calling her handicapped, getting outraged at everything on her behalf, and making every conversation about her disability. Good God, there's episodes with dead ducks and a Native American Zack, and this is the most awkward word saved by the bell I've ever seen. In the regular universe, Zack may be a monster, but in the Tory universe, He's more of a monster in the Bradley Whitford from Get Out sort of way. You know, to where he pretends to be nice, but it's like, no, no, dude, that's secretly really messed up. 
Zack hasn't given in to his gambling addiction in a while, so he and Slater make a bet to see who will kiss Tori first. Fellas, fellas, I don't think Tori is interested in either one of you or your sex. It's another Love Letters episode where Screech writes love letters to Lisa, only there's a misunderstanding, and Mr. Belding thinks the letters are from a teacher with bad eyesight. Why do I say another Love Letters episode? Because almost the same exact thing happened in Good Morning Miss Bliss. The bet between Zack and Slater reaches a hiccup when Zack realizes that he's in love with Tori. <laughs> so he can't kiss a girl unless he's tricking them? What? Plus, Lisa thinks the love letters are from Zack. Didn't we already resolve this whole Lisa Screech Zack thing? Oh right, that was in the other universe. The gang wants to win a radio contest to win a free trip to Hawaii, so they rig the competition to make Zack the 10th caller, but he's got after-school detention. How is he gonna make it to the max to win the prize? Um, just skip out on detention and take whatever the punishment for that is. It's a trip to Hawaii. It'll be worth it. Does it really matter if they win or lose this contest? A month after this aired, the TV movie Saved by the Bell Hawaiian style aired. You know, where they all go visit Kelly's grandfather, Dean Jones. So they make it to Hawaii regardless. Er, wait, maybe they don't. This is the Tory universe, so maybe their Hawaiian style is uh, vacationing at Devil's Island with Bob Crane. We're now back in the Jesse and Kelly universe, which I am also calling the Ben Tramer universe. The wrestling scout who wants to give Slater a scholarship is named Jeff Tramer clearly Ben's brother. There's a bit of a predicament, though, since Slater's military dad wants him to go to a military college. Something, 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 Varsity Blues. Sure, they try fooling the congressman by having Zack dress up as Slater, but I can't help but think it would be a lot funnier if they brought back Mark Blankfield to do the impersonating, whether it's of the congressman, Slater, or Slater's dad, anyone. None of this matters anyway. I've seen the preview views for the sequel series, and Slater is back at Bayside, coaching. And since one of the military officers is Michael Jai White, that character clearly becomes Spawn. Hmm, this episode is called Drinking and Driving. I wonder if it'll be a very special episode. It could be the gang is having an Animal House style toga party, so the message will obviously be, if you're gonna drink and drive, just don't get caught. Now let's go sabotage the parade. You know, one of the most unrealistic things about this show is that someone like Zack or Slater, who have no problem peeping in on the girl's locker room, would draw the line at drinking a beer. They even crashed Lisa's mom's car. This is the same group that crashed Belding's car when they were setting Lisa up with Jesse's evil stepbrother. This car scheme is kind of a step down. And when Zack's dad screams at him, he says, I'm shocked you would be this irresponsible. Really? How? The dude manipulated phone lines to win a radio contest. This is a really gullible universe. Couldn't most episodes be called Love Machine, whether it's in the Tory or Kelly universe? Hell, the episode barely has anything to do with Screech's new invention, the love machine. It's barely the B-plot. Slater's girlfriend, Jennifer from Germany, becomes a new student at Bayside, and uh-oh, Slater didn't properly break up with her when he was in Germany. You know what other universe this is taking place in? The season three universe, because that is clearly when this episode was filmed. Slater and Jesse are still dating in this episode, which is why he's trying to avoid the girl from Germany. Maybe they thought we wouldn't notice, since whether it's season three, or the Kelly universe, or the Tory universe, do you think Jennifer is ever mentioned again? Come on, have you learned nothing from me at this point? 
speaking of aired out of order, not that this one is necessarily, but it's about time they acknowledged that several episodes ago, Zack and Tori said they were into each other. Here they're dating, but they weren't in the several episodes in between, which makes me think that this was supposed to air right after the Kiss Bet episode. Oh, and Screech can no longer get mad at Zack over the Lisa thing, since Screech falls for Tori here. What is this, love triangle season? Zack Slater Joanna, Zack Screech Lisa, Zack Screech Tori. This is why they need to pick a girlfriend and stick with them. For instance, how the hell does Nerdstrom have a comeback in this episode? But we still don't know where the remains of Tori Spelling's character are buried. And Zack should know he's getting scammed by a ring salesman. The salesman is Gaston. Well, here's one way to stretch out this long-ass season. Add a clip show. It's Valentine's Day, so the gang is all reminiscing about their love lives and the schemes Zack used to do to try to get Kelly. Oh, you don't have to remind me of these past moments. I've been binge-watching it forever now. I know this show more than a talking slap bracelet does. And why does there even need to be a clip show? This gives the false impression that these relationships have any kind of continuity. But given that a lot of one-time love interests appear in these clips, at least it's acknowledging their existence while still not telling us where the bodies are buried. I wonder what's going on in the Tory universe. Maybe they're all reminiscing about Mikey and Nikki from Good Morning Miss Bliss. <laughs> Someone has to. Uh, I'm halfway through this long-ass season of Saved by the Bell. <laughs> I had no idea until watching Saved by the Bell that there are a hundred hours in a day. There's no reminiscing to previous episodes in the Tory universe. Instead, an alumni leaves the students $10,000 in his will. But the boys want it for boy sports, and the girls want it for girl sports. So the sexes all have to compete against each other. Why don't you just put the best choices for a vote, or I don't know, let the school board handle it? No, no, it's much easier to sabotage the baking competition by burning the girls' cake. And now the girls won't go with them to the dance. I'm sure there's just as many dances in the Tory universe as there are in the Kelly universe. Back in the Kelly universe, they have a lot of catching up to do to compete with the Tory universe because there's a lot going on here. Zack sabotages the teachers in order to prolong a teacher strike so he can cut class and go on a ski trip. But that causes the academic bowl to get canceled, so Zack ends the strike and all is well. But apparently that plot was resolved far too quick because the episode keeps going. Screech comes down with a cold and can't participate in the academic bowl, so Zack has to fill in for him? Why? This school is like half nerd. Pick one of them to replace Screech. And even that's not enough plot. So Jesse is filling in for Kelly at the max because Tiffany Amber Theason isn't in this episode and they still needed someone to serve burgers? So, Slater has a sister. <laughs> I know I should probably be more upset that Slater randomly has a sister who we've never seen before and is never seen again after this episode, but I'm more distracted by the doo-wop musical number they sing to Ginger waitressing at the Max and Mr. Belding dressed up like a bear. Oh, have I not mentioned Ginger? She's played by Bridget Wilson as a semi-regular in about four episodes of the Ginger universe. She just shows up now and then to say dumb blonde things and maybe date one of them. She's like Jake, Phoebe's boyfriend from a couple episodes of Friends, who didn't have an intro, nor did he have an outro. They just sort of exist for a few episodes. I'm also distracted by Zack dating Slater's sister here, because this is after he and Tori begin dating, so I guess this was filmed before that episode? Goddamn, is there any universe in this series that respects strict continuity. 
Well, Zack doesn't have feelings for Slater's sister anymore, or Tori anymore, because this is the Kelly universe, where Zack gets newfound feelings for Kelly and wants to take her to the prom, but she's already got a date. There's bigger issues, though. Because of room space, there might not be a prom. Excuse me, I'm fairly certain you've held a dance in every room at this school. Just pick one of them. And I find it hard to believe that there's low ticket sales for the prom. The students have no problem going to all the other dances. Unless they've already spent their allowances on all of those minor dances. This dance is hot, though. No, seriously. Jesse and Slater are locked in the utility room and the furnace breaks. I think Zack and Kelly end up back together in this. They even say, we belong together. And it also looks like Jesse and Slater may get back together. But I don't care. Because... Because we're going back to season two. And I thought they were going to follow that up with another Tory episode. But no, no. Between alternate universes and clip shows, we also need previous season holdover episodes. Or Screech just shrunk and his voice got higher randomly. Anything's possible. I mean, Zack has his freezing powers back. Oddly, it sort of fits after the last episode because Zack and Kelly are together in this one. How is it that this makes more sense in continuity than the actual episodes filmed during season four? But is Zack more evil in the early episodes? Well, in this one, Zack uses footage from the video yearbook to sell his dating tapes to lonely guys. That way he can make money to buy a car. <laughs> He's a video pimp to high school girls. In other words, he was the same Zach Morris two years ago. Oh good, we're not back in season two, nor are we in the Tory universe, because we're going all the way back to season one for this holdover episode. You can tell because Ed Alonzo is in the opening credits, and this time it's Zack who hasn't hit puberty or his growth spurt yet. Out of curiosity, did anyone notice this when it aired, or did you just think it was a repeat and you missed the original airing? Even Kevin the Robot is back. I guess they did drop him after a while. Maybe they they were asking too many questions. Zack has a full-on conversation with the robot here. Screech should be rich enough to own the school by now. This is the one where the gang forgets Screech's birthday, so they hold him a surprise party in Belding's office. I don't know why he's upset the show forgot his birthday too, since it aired years later. Thank God we're forward in time again. And by that, I mean it's a holdover from season two. This is not the kind of show to watch when you're tired because this time hopping and continuity is driving me insane. Is this really happening or am I crazy? Anyway, this is the one where the gang puts on a rap version of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. <laughs> yep, I am going crazy. Oh, and the nerds are the Seven Dwarves. I mean, the Seven Dwarves as they call them. You know, given this is around the time of the High Tops musical, this Saved by the Bell rap musical seems par for the course for the very early 90s. This episode is a must-see. It's made this whole day worth it. Kelly raps about apples, and Zack raps to bring Snow White back to life. Oh, and Zack and Jesse cheat on Kelly and Slater by making out behind the scenes. But who cares? Kelly raps about mirrors, yo. It's good that Jesse and Slater stayed together in the last episode. Same with Zack and Kelly. Anyway, back to the Tory universe, where Zack and Tori are dating, maybe, I think. This is also the universe where we actually see Mrs. Belding, and she's not only pregnant, but due in a couple of weeks. What a huge piece of information about a character to just suddenly drop on the audience. Belding's gonna be a dad. And I guess the students are his only friends. The baby shower is at the school with Zack and the gang. Well, Zack and the Beldings are about to get really close because Zack and Tori deliver Mrs. Belding's baby while they're trapped in an elevator. Zack has never before had so much leverage. The next time he gets detention, all he has to say is, I delivered your baby. 
This episode opens with Zack saying, I can't believe I'm homesick during the first week of school. Gee, I wonder if this was supposed to air earlier. Does it really matter, though? In case one clip show wasn't enough to prolong the season, here's another clip show. This time, it flashes back to the Malibu Beach episodes, but this is important, and I'll tell you why. Zack says this took place last summer, which seals it that this takes place between junior and senior year. Don't worry, it still manages to get confusing because it also flashes to the time they all went to Palm Springs for Jesse's dad's wedding. That was a different trip, or was it? I guess it was the same summer. I don't know anymore. This whole season is like a clip show because we're back to a holdover episode from season one. Not gonna lie, season four is kind of a mess. Now granted, maybe this is just appropriate for it taking place in senior year. I slacked off like crazy during my senior year. It was the equivalent of clip shows and holdover episodes of my school career. I can't imagine why this episode was held over. What was the pitch meeting of this one like? Slater has the gang pet sit for his chameleon, and the chameleon dies under their watch, and Slater is crushed and blames them for it. <laughs> yeah, animals are cursed around this gang. Also, Zack keeps a cardboard cutout of Kelly under his bed. I bet he bangs it. We are back in the Tory universe where the gang wants to create a school song for future classes to sing. Um, you already have a theme called Saved by the Bell. I've heard it about 80 times in the past few weeks. And since the school song does appear in the new class episodes, does that mean that Saved by the Bell, the new class, takes place in the Tory universe? Or at least some of the new class, maybe. That series was about as good at continuity with the cast as this one is with continuity of the episodes. And why the hell is Zack mad that he's gonna be remembered as a troublemaker? Not only is that what he is, but isn't that what he's always wanted to be? Rigging the competition to make himself seem nicer and to turn everyone else against each other doesn't help. Dude's in denial. Oh, before I forget, the previous episode was Tori's last episode. She's not given a proper exit, so I guess she and Zack only dated for like one episode, and she's not even at the graduation. Apparently, there were more important things to get to in this episode. This is the third clip show of the season. The clip shows have better arcs than Tori. Maybe she's hanging out with Miss Bliss. They were both in Parent Trap 3. I honestly didn't mind Tori. Liana Creel did a really good job, and I liked that she was her own character, as opposed to being a copycat of Jesse or Kelly. I can kind of see why the Zack and Tori dating thing was dropped, since there wasn't much lead up to it, and it did feel really forced. Sorry, I'd rather talk about that than another clip show. This one has future students finding a time capsule with Zack and the gang talking about their time at Bayside. I guess all of their adventures were being secretly recorded because how did all of this end up on a videotape that the future class is watching? And one of the clips is the I'm so excited moment. Why is that in the time capsule? Maybe there is a lot to talk about with this episode, but I'd rather not. I know that this is the finale, but it's weird to even think of it as that. Yeah, sure, they're graduating, but does time even exist in this world? This season had alternate universes, clip shows, jumping back and forth between their ages, yeah, they're graduating, but it feels more like they're living in some kind of high school purgatory. And are the couples even still together? I thought the prom episode had them hooking back up, but I don't know. A lot of alternate timelines have happened since then. I feel like I'm a parent after their kids get their diploma and now the other students are doing their thing when I just want to go home. So Zach needs one more credit to graduate, so he does balance 
LA, and then they all graduate. Well, except Tori. Maybe she graduated at semester, but I am still going with the alternate universe theory. Oddly, it's the one that makes the most sense. At least Zach gets to give a speech at graduation, though. Isn't that usually who speaks at graduations? The valedictorian and the guy who used the video yearbook is dating videos for the hot girls? Now that high school is over, they can rest up this summer because coming up next is the college years. Except for Lisa and Jesse. They come back for the wedding in Vegas. Saved by the Bell is moved to After Dark. Now, that doesn't mean it gets raunchy, it just means it's now a primetime show instead of Saturday morning. Saved by the Bell was such a cultural phenomenon that it made sense to want to continue their adventures in college. Maybe the networks learned their lesson when Gabe Kaplan wanted Welcome Back Cotter to move on to college, but the network was like, no, and the show was canceled. Which, in fairness, Saved by the Bell the college years wasn't exactly a success. The College Years aired on Tuesday nights on NBC, making it the only Saved by the Bell series that aired in primetime. The show was canceled after one season, and look, I'm just glad I only got 19 episodes here instead of 26. How do you make Saved by the Bell even more 90s? Well, the theme song, Standing on the Edge of Tomorrow, helps. What also helps is that the opening credits look like a Nickelodeon intro, but with the clothing style of silk stockings. What a difference a year makes. Zack is bulked up as hell. Bud is still talking to the camera, checking out girls, and intruding into their rooms. This is like a weird prequel to the Mark Paul Gossler college rape movie, She Cried No. See, some things are still the same. Zack Slater and Screech are all roommates, what are the odds? The belding of the series is resident advisor Mike Rogers, played by Bob Golick, so he's belding by way of a Donald Gibb-like action hero. It doesn't take long for him to catch the gang drinking, see what I mean? All it took was them moving to primetime for our leads to be okay with drinking. Man, college is just like high school. Zach gets the gang in trouble, and new character Leslie Leslie apologizes to Zack. And one of the main characters here is Danielle, played by Essence Atkins, who is never seen again after the pilot. Well, in fairness to Danielle leaving, they do actually explain it when Screech says she transferred to a different school. See, was it so hard to explain a character's disappearance? She needed to go because now Kelly is back. She is also a dorm mate with Zach in a dorm room that is bigger than Monica and Rachel's apartment. This gets complicated because Zach is also interested in Leslie, and I don't think he should end up with either one of them. Before he knows knows Kelly is back, he tells Leslie that Kelly drowned at sea and he's finally able to start dating again. Zack is like Eric Otter Stratton if he belonged to the Omega House. Hell, he even copies Leslie's schedule so he can coincidentally be in the same classes as her. Didn't Zack and Kelly end up together at the end of the last season? Maybe? Sorta? I don't know. It's all so complicated. And do you really want to be dating a college boy version of Zack? Okay, maybe this one is raunchier. I can't imagine the Saturday morning version having a title that references sex, lies, and videotape. Another new character is added. This time, it's Patrick Fabian as the dreamy Professor Lasky. He gives Zack an assignment to find out what women want, which, of course, leads to Zack secretly recording girls' conversations. Somehow, Zack seems worse in this series. I know they did the secret recording thing before, but it's different when it's a hormonal high school student versus a bulked out adult college student. Again, I'm glad we have this series because it mentions Tori Spelling, the actress, which means Tori Spelling herself exists in this universe. Maybe she was secretly herself when she was dating Screech and she was simply just doing research for a movie role. Hey, at least that's some kind of explanation. But Zack learns his lesson that not all women think the same, which means he gets an automatic B and can skip out on the rest of class, which he doesn't 
doesn't do because he wants an A. Just the fact that this creep was given the option to skip out on his classes makes this a worse college than the one from God's Not Dead. Okay, this is the one I actually remember seeing when it first aired. I don't know how much the other episodes I'll remember, but that damn Jonathan Wolf theme song is gonna be stuck in my head forever. The boys want to make it into a fraternity, but they're worried that Screech will embarrass them. Yeah, they've sort of done this plot before, but it's worse here because Zack can't even remember what Screech's first name is. It's when Leslie teaches Zack and Slater about friendship that I realize <laughs> Okay, Leslie is the Jesse of this series. It makes sense Jesse went to a much better college. They shouldn't even be worried about getting into a frat. Zach Morris looks like if a fraternity manifested itself into a person. Zack is still pursuing Leslie, which is weird, considering I know how the series ends. He's trying to get her to go on a ski trip, and wasn't he broke in the pilot? Anyway, the main plot has to do with Slater embracing his Hispanic heritage after hitting it off with student Teresa. Yes, but wouldn't it be much funnier if it was about Zack finding out he's black? Hey, if you thought it was bad that Zack forgot Screech's name, here he's just now realizing Slater is Hispanic after for years thinking he was Italian. Slater gets a little too into this class when he begins thinking that everything is racist. <laughs> okay, now it is starting to feel like a real college. Although it feels weird having an episode about a student protest and Jesse isn't here. It's a very serious episode about Slater's heritage, which is why the Hispanic Student Union is saved by a speech from Zack. Ooh, a homecoming episode, but a college version. I hope the next one has a love triangle in it. There's other familiar things about this plot. A celebrity football alumni comes back, Zack looks up to him, but it turns out he's a creep. I hope he doesn't also smoke pot. But at least their roommate Alex sort of gets an episode here in a B plot where randomly she's a love interest for Slater. She's starting out like she could be the Milo of the series, where she's just sort of there and incredibly one note. Her whole character is just that she wants to be an actress, so she overacts a lot. Here, she goes on a date with Slater and dresses up like the school mascot and then gets mad at Slater because he's embarrassed. Um, I'm on Slater's side. If I was at a black tie event and my date showed up dressed like a giant falcon, I'd be embarrassed. Though I don't know if I'd be surprised Alex did this. Never mind Milo, Alex is the Kimmy Gibbler of the series. Damn, I was so close. It's not a love triangle episode. It's a Zack gambling addiction episode. Zack wants to have a poker night, but Mike forbids it in the dorms. All right, I like the character Mike. He serves the same purpose as Belding, but with a more football player personality. And I'm usually on his side, but here, it's like he's just being a hard ass for the sake of a plot. The boys have to set him up on a date with Professor Nancy Stafford so that they can have a seat secret game of poker, but the date doesn't go well since it's her only episode. See, you should have just let them play poker. You killed another one-time love interest. Seriously, the episode ends with Mike and the professor almost burning down the dorm from having sex. Maybe she burnt to death. So with the show suffering in the ratings, maybe it isn't a good idea to have a Comedy Central light on the shelf. Why yes, I should be watching a different channel. But I guess that's more realistic than the girls' room with a big Summers Bee poster on the wall. Sorry, I'm distracted. Back to the episode. Remember when Zack stayed in Professor Lasky's class because he wanted an A? Here, he pretends to be the professor because he finds out the professor has an admirer who's hot. As you can see, Zack really learned a lot from his What Women Want report. Okay, so that's the plot, but forget that. The important thing is, this is the David A.R. White episode. He's in one scene where he buys a candy bar from Mike, and he has the same hairstyle that John Glover had in Scrooged. That's my backstory for this character. He's Bryce Cummings' son! Ah, good. Here's the love triangle episode. I was worried there for a second. 
Zack is dating a tennis pro, and Screech starts tutoring her, and the two of them begin hitting it off. Look, does anyone actually think this character is going to be in more than one episode? Although the actress was in the Mark Paul Gossler, Candace Cameron, She Cried No movie, see, I am positive and terrified that this is the same universe. Oh, and I guess Slater and Alex are still dating, since she goes to his games and they kiss a few times. This relationship is so forced. Slater dating the princess had more of a lead up to it. Here's hoping that relationship has an ending, unlike this one. Screech tells Linda he loves her, they kiss, and why even go this far if she's only going to be in one episode? Oh, Kelly's a doctor now. She's an assistant at the Student Medical Center, where they're doing things that I think they'd be doing around season three of Scrubs. Good thing she has friends there to support her. When she says she wants to take pre-med, Zack's all like, mm, you don't seem the doctor type. Oh, I'm so glad these two get married. She wants to be a waitress instead, Leslie switches with her, and she becomes a medical assistant. <laughs> what? What kind of college is this? Even Slater's an ass here, too. When Alex gets a job at a Hooters-type restaurant, Slater gets all jealous. I miss Slater and Jesse being together. It's okay, Zack gets Kelly back into pre-med when making a lot of money as a waitress makes her act like an 80s movie hooker. <laughs> what kind of restaurant is this? The gang gets stuck at college for Thanksgiving, and in true realistic fashion, when they don't have thawed turkeys to feed the kids, celebrities show up. Jonathan Brandis, Marsha Warfield, Brian Austin Green, as themselves bringing already made turkeys to the kids. And that's not the most far-fetched thing. Mr. Belding also shows up because he just happened to be in the area and saw them on the news. I have more questions. If Brian and Austin Green is here, does that mean the original pilot of Good Morning Miss Bliss exists? And Tiffany Amber Thiessen was also on 90210, so does Tiffany Amber Thiessen, the actress, exist here? The Westfall universe is just the tip of the iceberg in TV paradoxes. Hell, it really is just a coincidence that I switched to my IT hat in a season where Jonathan Brandis shows up. Plus, this is like the second episode in a row that has ended with Zack and Kelly kissing. Are they back together or what? Well, not officially yet, I guess. Zack realizes he's in love with her again, but she gets feelings for Professor Jeremiah Lasky. Well, he's better than Jeff from the Max. Honestly, I get why she'd have feelings for the professor. He's cool, funny, he's a good father, and Patrick Fabian is pretty awesome. He's great in The Last Exorcism. Cotton is one of the most underrated horror movie leads. The episode ends on a cliffhanger where Lasky and Kelly kill and I'm like, okay, he's a way better catch than Zach Morris. Oh, and Screech is hiding a chimpanzee in his room, because of course he is! So Kelly and Lasky are dating, and I'm sorry, am I supposed to be rooting for Zach? Kelly and Lasky do have really good chemistry, and Zach spends the whole time scheming to break them up, including outing their relationship in front of the whole class. Now sure, you can say, well, Lasky and Kelly's relationship does seem pretty unethical. But several episodes ago, Zach pretended to be Lasky in order to get laid by his biggest fan. Suddenly, Lasky and Kelly's relationship seems pretty normal in comparison. In this one, Zach goes to the costume ball, dressed in the same costume as Lasky, so he can trick Kelly into making out with him. And when Lasky breaks it off with her because of how understandably complicated it is, she pushes him off of a balcony and then apologizes to Zack, who is conveniently there to comfort her. Man, I don't like this relationship at all. 
Ooh, ooh, we got a new teacher character now. It's Robert Guillaume as the hard-ass ethics professor. I hope he and Kelly start dating. But will Zach learn an important lesson in ethics when he finds the midterm answers and wants to cheat? Gee, you think the professor planted that to secretly test them on ethics? At least they could have figured, well, maybe if we give the answers back, we'll be on the teacher's good side. I am running out of things to talk about with this show. This is a filler episode. This is the only one this professor is in. Well, one professor who's back is Lasky. I'm glad they didn't just make him disappear like all of Screech's girlfriends. Zach gives him shit again in class for dating Kelly, and yeah, while it's a moral gray area, dude, you dressed up like Lasky so you could trick Kelly. At least it seemed like Lasky had feelings for her. If Zach was a college professor, let's not pretend he wouldn't put his phone number on all the hot girls' papers. Hell, he breaks into the class room to have a rave, and Lasky covers for him to Dean Holland Taylor, so I guess they're friends again. Are they not concerned that a group of students tried to get high off of nitrous oxide? Okay, I kind of figured they'd try making Lasky a little weird as the series goes on. That way, I don't know, I guess we'd have to root for Zack. Here, Lasky is under so much stress from Kelly that he's hospitalized for ulcers and is nervous about having any women in his office. Okay, dude, you're getting close to going into old-fashioned territory. But with that being said, he's still better than Zack. Zack takes a job as an assistant at the student medical Medical center because I guess anyone can do that. He does this to get closer to Kelly, and I mean very close, like standing behind her and saying, I'm touched that you're touched, and since we're both touched, maybe we should be touching. He gets fired for being bad at his job. <laughs> what? But he was great at pushing the Dean away in a wheelchair so he could run and spy on Kelly some more. It's okay, he pretends to be sick so he can become Lasky's hospital roommate. Oh, and you want to know the kicker? Kelly screams at Lasky over this, saying, Zack is willing to do anything for me and you're doing nothing, guy in hospital with an ulcer. She throws a pillow at him and the audience applauds this. 1994 was crazier than I remembered. And then there was the time the gang threw a surprise party for a dead man. That's right, Professor Victor Raider Wexler is retiring, so the gang comes in throwing confetti on him while he sits silently on the couch and is dead. But remember, this is all about Zack. On the day of the funeral, he gives Kelly an ultimatum to tell him whether or not she loves him. He even interrupts the eulogy to give a speech about embracing life. It's when he nearly goes skydiving that Kelly tells him she loves him so he won't jump out of a plane. Wow, if Lasky wants to win Kelly back, all he has to do is just stalk her, sexually harass her at work, and threaten to skydive. Maybe Lasky is better off without Kelly. Kelly and Zach's rekindled romance is more insane than the party for the dead man. Zack and Kelly are back together and off to a great start. She's offered to go on a school cruise for the summer to the Mediterranean, which Zack is dead set against because, as he puts it, what about me? Oh, and Slater cheats on Alex because another girl has a nice car or something. Oh, man, and I thought Slater and Alex were going to be together forever. Zack tries inserting himself into Kelly's trip, giving attitude to any guy that might be hitting on her, scaring Screech out of going on the trip so that Zack can take his place, and something, something, he proposes to Kelly because he has a nightmare that she leaves and cheats on him. And before anyone starts comparing Zack to Ross Geller, no, 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 no. Friends was written to be very aware of Ross's flaws and even address them like his issues with jealousy and the psychological reasons behind that. This show is not aware of Zack's flaws. 
Well, look, maybe this show is realistic. It's not uncommon for two lovesick college students to just get married out of the blue. They're really sad when their parents and everyone else are against the wedding because they're too young. <laughs> yeah, no shit! Just this year, Kelly was head over heels in love with her professor, and Zach pretended that Kelly was dead so he could bang Leslie. Oh, and Lisa's back, too, who's fighting with Alex and Leslie over who gets to be maid of honor. How is this an issue? Let's see. Best friends since forever, or two people that I just met this year. So Saved by the Bell, the college years was canceled, making this the last episode, even though the ratings weren't radically different than the ratings for the Saturday morning show, it's just that primetime ratings have slightly different standards. The show probably should have stayed on Saturday mornings, because it's still Saturday morning sitcom jokes. And if people were looking for this kind of sitcom in primetime, they were probably watching Full House, which aired opposite the college years, and beat it in the ratings. They still gave the characters a proper send-off in Saved by the Bell, Wedding in Las Vegas, but there's something else that's going to extend this binge watch about 10 episodes. <laughs> Man, it's taken me so long to do this binge watch that Saved by the Bell is back and Christmas is over! The Jonathan Brandis College Years cameo has inspired me to wear my IT shirt along with my IT hat. Saved by the Bell has been revived as a single camera series on Peacock TV, developed by Tracy Wigfield of 30 Rock and featuring much of the original cast in supporting roles. So it seems like they're setting out to make a smarter version of Saved by the Bell, but does that translate to funny. Well, that was different. There's some things I like here, such as Zach Morris becoming governor of California, which seems realistic considering what his reason for doing so is, and also his platform. I like the concept that students from a more realistic high school are being transferred to Bayside because of Zach's policies, and the best characters on the show are naturally the returning cast members. Too bad they're not the leads. The show is part catchy up with the old cast members and part punishingly self-aware comedy. Jessie is the guidance counselor and her autobiography is called I'm So Excited, I'm So Scared. Zach Morris's son, Mac, is a Zach-like student, but it feels fake because everything he does is written to be a critique of the original show and not a character. He says things like, what do you mean you don't have your own personal poster guy? And if our lead, Daisy, is supposed to be the realistic one, then why is she the one with the time-freezing powers? I mean, props for trying to do something smart, but this feels like I'm watching an extended Jimmy Fallon parody of Saved by the Bell, and not Saved by the Bell. <laughs> Ugh, the club auto-tuned cover of the Saved by the Bell theme makes me miss standing on the edge of tomorrow, and that theme made me want to jump out a window the second time I heard it. My god, every line in this winks at the camera more so than Zack pausing time and literally winking at the camera. At least when Zack froze time, it was kind of charming. Here, it takes me out of it every single time. Whenever Daisy freezes time, it comes with a record screech sound effect, followed by our lead speaking in Twitter complaints. That's not funny. That's obnoxious. Seriously, can I just watch a show about Zach Morris being governor? That sounds fun. This show is a wet blanket where Mac Morris is less of a character and more of just a straw man for the 90s. On the plus side, at least Slater does reference his one-time girlfriends, but it's followed Followed up by him saying, Oh, now that I say it out loud, that's kind of sad. Thanks, writer and not AC Slater. 
I like that the show has yet to mention Screech's disappearance, but it has an appearance from Mr. Dewey. Well, we've got a love triangle episode between Mac Morris, Jesse's son Jamie Spano, and random girl Pamela. Of course, they're not really genuine about it. It's done as a parody, like when Daisy pauses time to say, You know they're both interested in the same girl, right? When Mac and Jamie think that they've fallen in love with different girls, they say, What are the odds we've fallen in love with two different girls at the same time? Yes, thanks. I got it. You know what, show? You're not as smart as you think you are. In fact, you're wildly condescending. I haven't even gotten to Slater lecturing the team about toxic masculinity by pointing to a magazine that says toxic masculinity. I was going to say, this is like if Not Another Teen Movie was a direct sequel to Fast Times at Ridgemont High, but no, at least Not Another Teen Movie's top priority was being funny. This show's top priority is thinking it's better than you. You know, I don't really dislike the plots in this show. In fact, the one here with Lexi and Devante and their acting class has some sweet moments and a few laughs, but a majority of the plots in this show don't have a genuine bone in their body. They make a joke about the seniors looking older because they're played by adults, and it repeats that about eight times in the episode. You'll see kids from the senior class that are about 50 to 80 years old, and and then someone will say, Does anyone else notice this? They look way older. Yeah, man, another thing that not another teen movie did better. Again, you're not smarter than me, you condescending ass show. Stop it. <laughs> Hey, did you miss the caffeine pills joke in the first episode? Well, they do it again when Mac holds up caffeine pills and Jesse smacks it out of his hand and says, If you take these, you're going to get excited and more excited. Christ, this feels like if a modern internet review of Saved by the Bell just became Saved by the Bell. I was going to say it's like a funnier die sketch, but that's pretty much what it is. The writer from Zach Morris's Trash works on this. Look, that stuff is fun, but I don't need them to be the same product. I know I've complained a lot in this video, but I'm glad my binge watch episode is separate from Saved by the Bell. I like that Saved by the Bell is genuine. It's fun talking about how ridiculous it is, and I'm glad it exists. You can evolve your characters and address how they've grown while doing it genuinely, instead of replacing the characters with parody versions of themselves. Here they redo the plot where they hire a fake parent so Daisy can pretend to be guidance counselor Jesse. Only it holds our hand through this and explains to us why it's silly. God, just be a show and not an internet review. With its caffeine pills jokes, it's like it isn't made for people who grew up with Saved by the Bell, but made for people who have just seen clips of Saved by the Bell. Who <laughs> six episodes in and we already have a controversial episode. This is what happens when you cater your show to people who get outraged by everything. Sooner or later, they're going to come for you. The episode has a reference to Selena Gomez's kidney transplant, and it caused such hashtag internet outrage that the joke was removed from the episode. Luckily, I saw the version with the reference, and all it was was just two dumb girls arguing about tabloid rumors about whether or not Demi Lovato was the donor. It wasn't a joke at the expense of Selena Gomez. It was a joke at the expense of these shallow girls using that for tabloid gossip. Ooh, so offensive. Move over, aristocrats joke. My god, if that causes you to freak out, never watch the original, and whatever you do, don't watch South Park. <laughs> your outrage will nuke the whole planet. And seriously, producers, stop censoring your work because of this. Stand by it. Especially when a small part of the episode has to do with having thick skin and ignoring angry critics. <laughs> 
I know I'm complaining a lot about this, but I do want to say there is some things I like. There's seeds of what could be a really good show. The best part of it is Slater and Jesse. I like that she's a helicopter parent guidance counselor, and he's coming to terms that it's been 30 years since high school. They have a lot of focus in this episode, where Slater realizes he still has feelings for Jesse, but she's still married, so he goes out on a blind date. See, this I like. This is how you treat the characters respectfully. Really, they should be the leads. They had the best chemistry on the original series, and they're great in their roles here. But of course, the main focus is always on the parody universe with the students, like here when Mac and Lexi go 40k over budget on a party to break up another couple. <laughs> Okay, this one I kind of like, largely because the original cast are the main characters in it. It's Homecoming, so it's nice seeing them all snip at each other like old times, and I like how they're setting up Jesse and Slater's relationship. Plus, it does explain that Screech is living on a space station with Kevin the Robot. Hmm, seems legit. I'll allow it. Lisa also does a phone-in cameo where she's living in Paris. Hmm. I'll allow that too. But where is Belding? And can we get one episode in the Tory universe? Again, there's seeds of something really working, but the rest continues to be self-parody as hell. It's the third reference to the caffeine pills. Is that the only episode the writers saw? There's an in-joke about the freeze-frame high-fives, and when they all dress as the Zack attack, Zack says, Oh right, we were only famous in a dream that only I had. That doesn't feel like the characters talking. That feels like the writers trying to be cute. So let's see, there's the Kelly universe, the Miss Bliss universe, the Tory universe, and this appears to be a universe where Saved by the Bell exists as a show. That's sad, since they should know that the time capsule that they dig up is not the time capsule from the original series. <laughs> Ooh, sweet, back to the kids being the leads. Okay, with that being said, I am starting to like Mac Morris here. I like the issues he has with him trying to be close to his dad, and I like Lexi. The comedic timing between the two is pretty good. Still, could you just get rid of the self-aware shit? Mac has a fantasy sequence and then acknowledges it as a fantasy sequence. Cut to record scratch, Daisy looking at the camera. My eyes automatically roll into the back of my head whenever I hear the record scratch. Plus, Jamie Spano says, What are we supposed to do? Hang out after school because we're teens with no obligations? Ha <laughs> ha, good one, teen character speaking for 40-year-old writer. The drama in these last few episodes has to do with the closed high school reopening and the new students possibly having to leave. But if you ask me, when Rodney Hobbs showed up as the Douglas High principal, they wasted a golden opportunity to have the other principal be Milo from Good Morning Miss Bliss. <laughs> Well, it took until the finale, but they reference Tori in a wink-wink sort of way. Zack says, Hey, new kids keep things fresh. Remember Tori? And Kelly goes, Who? I'm still sticking with my multiple universe theory in that this one is a universe where they're all aware that Saved by the Bell is a show. Kelly is hardly even a character here. A majority of her dialogue is just referencing crazy things Zack did, like wanting to get Screech dissected. Again, that's not Kelly talking, that's the writer from Zach Morris's trash. Hell, this episode has the fourth reference to the caffeine pills addiction. However, I do kind of love the random ending where Mac Morris looks at his phone and says, Huh, what's coronavirus? Ooh, careful, you're gonna get yelled at on Twitter again. Saved by the Bell joking about the coronavirus is the biggest tragedy since Jennifer Aniston's pandemic ornament. I really hope that this show pulls a reverse Good Morning Miss Bliss and minimizes the kids while giving more focus to the adults. Slater and Jesse are great, but as for a lot of other things, my god. Can we just get someone who wants to write a good show that respects the characters as a opposed to using the original as a disguise for their super smart video essay. Okay, okay, it's about time we wrap this up. Okay, 
I feel weird about including the 2020 revival in this, since that's like doing a binge watch of Pokemon, but then ending things on Strokemon. The revival needs a lot of work. Moving on. Classic Saved by the Bell is great at being Saved by the Bell. Yeah, it's fun to rag on it, and I wouldn't recommend watching dozens of episodes in a day. But I still see why I loved it then and what makes it enjoyable now. It's genuine and unapologetic as a bubblegum sitcom. The characters are wildly memorable and the actors sell their performances. Mario Lopez has great comedic timing and Elizabeth Berkley is just a treasure. It's fun pointing out the ridiculousness of Zach Morris, but he is a great television character. You can see that the intent was for him to be like this Ferris Bueller type character that high schoolers would want to look up to, but the result is more like the high school years of Wolf of Wall Street Jordan Belfort. I don't think they were aware of this when they were making it, just like they weren't aware binge-watching would become a thing that would make the continuity an absolute nightmare. But it makes for damn entertaining television. Again, just don't watch so much of it in a single day like I did. You may go a bit insane. Well, if you made it to the end, don't forget to subscribe to our channel today and follow us on Twitter at The Cinema Snob. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to go get some sleep before I find something else to binge watch. Yeah.